prego. E, sono il co-direttore del centro Nexa insieme a Marco Ricolfi che è in missione ad Amsterdam e che salutiamo e con Maurizio Borghi, entrambi del, del Dipartimento di Giurisprudenza dell'Università di Torino, Maurizio è qui da qualche parte, eccolo lì, ciao Maurizio. E, iniziamo questa conferenza eh, di cui poi dopo illustreremo le caratteristiche subito dopo i saluti istituzionali, un po' particolare, un po' dire, originale anche per la nostra storia. E con i saluti appunto istituzionali per primo darei la parola al vice rettore per la ricerca che è tra l'altro il collega ingegnere informatico collega di dipartimento Matteo Sonsareorda che ringrazio di essere qui in rappresentanza del rettore buongiorno a tutti benvenuti al Politecnico eh, sono molto onorato di essere qui eh, in questo evento eh, annuale eh, importante per noi eh, vi porto i saluti del Rettore. Eh, come sapete il Politecnico eh, ritiene questa iniziativa eh, estremamente importante perché crede eh, che la nostra istituzione, istituzione ovviamente tecnica, eh, debba sempre ricordare eh, ciò che il Centro Nexa eh, persegue da decenni ormai, eh, ossia che è importante non solo eh, comprendere eh, ciò che sta succedendo intorno a noi dal punto di vista tecnico, non, non soltanto è importante cercare soluzioni ai problemi tecnici che eh, ci vengono proposti, ma sia importante anche capire eh, e discutere quali sono eh, gli impatti che questi problemi tecnici eh, come dire, hanno e quali sono gli impatti che le soluzioni che noi tecnici eh, possiamo eh, proporre. Da questo punto di vista voi sapete che il Politecnico è estremamente sensibile e attivo, eh, in termini di supporto al centro Nexa, in termini di attività che ehm, proponiamo ai nostri studenti per cercare di sensibilizzarli eh, su questi aspetti, eh, ad esempio eh, questi corsi sulle grandi sfide eh, che eh, combinano insieme eh, persone, docenti con competenze tecnologiche e altre con eh, competenze più umanistiche. Eh, abbiamo appena fondato eh, in primavera eh, un istituto eh, teseo che si occupa appunto dei legami tra la tecnologia e le scienze umane eh, vogliamo continuare in questa direzione e che quindi chiaramente eh, continueremo a supportare il centro Nexa e quindi le vostre attività eh, e quindi chiaramente vi ringrazio per essere qui e per il vostro supporto al centro Nexa e spero che il prossimo anno e i prossimi anni possano essere eh, la continuazione dell'attività che il Centro Nexa ha eh, svolto e ha eh, portato avanti eh, finora. Grazie molto e buona conferenza e buona permanenza a Torino per chi non è eh, di queste parti. Purtroppo il tempo non è dei migliori, quindi vi perdete lo spettacolo delle montagne che di qui è estremamente eh, piacevole. Ecco, purtroppo oggi il tempo, bisogna lamentarsi con gli organizzatori. <ride> Grazie e buon lavoro. Grazie molto Matteo. Ora invito con grande piacere la direttrice del Dipartimento di Automatica e Informatica, la professoressa Elena Baralis, e, e un invito che faccio con particolare piacere perché questo centro nasce nel 2006, quindi ormai sono 16 anni, dentro questo dipartimento. Quindi vuol dire che già 16 anni fa c'era un'attenzione un per un'iniziativa che all'epoca era sicuramente molto più eretica di quanto non sarebbe adesso, un'attenzione che è rimasta nel tempo, tanto è vero che siamo ancora qui, questo dipartimento quindi ci ha ospitato, ci ha incoraggiato fino ad oggi e quindi inclusa ovviamente la nostra collega direttrice Enela Barali, quindi sono molto contento che sia riuscito a liberarsi dei suoi, dei suoi impegni per essere qui presente, per salutare tra l'altro non soltanto voi qui che siete presenti fisicamente, ma anche coloro che sono collegati perché la conferenza è anche in streaming e verrà poi registrata e resa disponibile. Grazie molto. Grazie Juan Carlos, allora sì, benvenuti a tutti, welcome everybody, visto che qualcuno capisce magari benissimo l'italiano. Eh... Io sono molto contenta di ospitare ogni anno, ormai da tanti anni, questo, questo evento. In realtà io sono venuta anche come diciamo, eh, ascoltatrice nel passato, eh, quando non ero neanche direttore. Non mi prendo il merito di chi nel 2006 ha saputo vedere lontano, ma sono contenta di supportare adesso questa iniziativa che secondo me è un fiore all'occhiello per il nostro dipartimento, perché come diceva Matteo, eh, diciamo, contempera la parte dell'impatto sociale con quella invece dello sviluppo tecnologico. 
e quindi io considero che questo aspetto sia quello più importante per ricordarsi sempre che tutto quello che noi facciamo ha un effetto sulla società e sulle persone e che quindi questo effetto non va dimenticato quando lo facciamo perché quello è il momento in cui dobbiamo, dobbiamo pensarci. Eh, per il tema invece di, della giornata di oggi purtroppo non potrò fermarmi ma sono veramente curiosa e interessata perché immaginare il futuro o anche immaginare una parte del presente mi sembra veramente un, un esercizio che possa aprire le menti e aumentare la nostra creatività anche come scienziati e quindi penso che sia un tema che eh, è veramente stimolante dal punto di vista di quello che può eh, produrre anche nella scienza no? perché immaginare il futuro vuole anche dire provare a pensare degli effetti quindi parlavamo del sociale prima ma anche delle nuove tecnologie che adesso non esistono che sembrano impensabili e incredibili ma per cui magari c'è una strada per una realizzazione diversa nel mondo reale non in quello della fantasia quindi io penso che sia veramente una, come dire, una relazione interessante quella tra la fiction e invece la, la realtà tecnologica Detto questo, non porterei via spazio eh, a, al, a, al collega Fulvio Corno che invece ha delle cose in più da dirvi, secondo me, su, sulla parte, perché noi abbiamo anche dei corsi di laurea che vanno in quella direzione lì, e in particolare Ingegneria del Cinema e dei Mezzi di Comunicazione, che è un corso di laurea che eh, cerca di contemperare proprio la parte informatica e quella creativa. E quindi io sono stata coordinatore molto tempo fa, prima di essere direttore del Dipartimento, quindi mi ricordo che anche lì ero ben contenta di avere questo tipo di iniziative un po' diverse no? rispetto al mondo tecnologico tradizionale, no? quello di ingegneria. Bene, io adesso in realtà prima sono Carlos, scusa. Io ringrazio molto e grazie al direttore del Dipartimento. Eh, terzo saluto istituzionale del, del collega Fulvio Corno, che invito a sedersi qua vicino a me, e anche lui ingegnere informatico, e, come avete intuito. E, il Fulvio, insieme a Maurizio Rebaudengo, si occupa eh, della didattica, diciamo in maniera semplice, del, dei nostri corsi di laurea, tra cui appunto quello che ha ricordato la professoressa Baralis, quindi ingegnere di media dei cinema e dei mezzi di comunicazione. E, ma è qui quindi con, con quel taglio, ma anche con un taglio aggiuntivo che vi racconterà lui, cioè un interesse specifico per la fantascienza e quindi sono molto contento di aver scoperto questo lato che non conoscevo fino adesso del collega Fulvio Corno. Grazie. Grazie Juan Carlos. Eh, ringrazio ancora eh, anch'io eh, sia il centro Nexa che eh, il MUFANT no, di, di questa occasione, di, quest di aver organizzato questa conferenza. Eh, Fa molto piacere sia essere qua, ma soprattutto che si parli, no, si parli di queste tematiche. Eh, come diceva Juan Carlos, eh, io sono vice coordinatore del collegio eh, di ingegneria del cinema, informatica e meccatronica, eh, un nome lungo per indicare diciamo così, la, la struttura del Politecnico che si occupa appunto dei corsi di laurea, vari corsi di laurea in ingegneria informatica, in primis, ma ingegneria eh, del cinema e dei mezzi di comunicazione. Data Science Engineering, Ingegneria Meccatronica e dall'anno prossimo anche il Cyber Security. Um, quindi abbiamo diciamo, una vasta platea di studenti che in qualche modo no, eh, approfondiscono eh, queste tematiche legate al digitale, ovviamente dal punto di vista tecnologico e come già accennava eh, la direttrice, eh, in particolare poi nel corso di Ingegneria del Cinema e dei Mezzi di Comunicazione, eh, questa diciamo così, competenza eh, tecnologica viene ibridata, no? con competenze di più di tipo eh, di comunicativo e creativo. Eh, tra l'altro, giusto per chiudere il cerchio, no, il corso di laurea in ingegneria del cinema collabora già eh, da anni col, col MUFANT eh, no, attraverso dei, dei, delle challenge, dei, dei, dei premi agli studenti. Quindi questa contaminazione non, non si ferma alle nostre aule, ma per fortuna si estende almeno, almeno al piano cittadino, in certo senso. Ehm, eh, quindi questo... Eh, Dicevo, sono felice che questo tema venga affrontato perché eh, tutto sommato c'è, cioè, come responsabile della didattica in campo informatico, cioè, è, è innegabile no? che ci sia un link tra quello che è il mondo della science fiction, della fantascienza, eh, inteso in senso lato, no? e anche è quello che è il mondo delle tecnologie. 
Eh, io sono convinto che se giriamo per i corridoi del Politecnico molti studenti no, abbiano covi no, in modo più o meno esplicito, no, perché poi alcune cose magari le tieni per te, ma eh, eh, in modo più o meno esplicito no, una, una passione, no, un interesse per la fantascienza delle sue varie forme in cui si è declinata, magari da quella diciamo così, un pochino più, più profonda a quella un pochino più commerciale che eh, si, è, eh, si è espansa negli ultimi anni, ma tutto sommato tutto, diciamo, porta in, in tutto, che, tutto, tutto ciò che porta interesse, tutto sommato è, è, è favorevole. Favorevole eh, da due punti di vista, no? il primo punto di vista è eh, secondo me il fatto che eh, entrare in contatto con i contenuti fantascientifici in qualche modo stimola no? quella che è la l'interesse, la creatività, la consapevolezza magari nei ragazzi sul fatto che vogliono magari intraprendere delle carriere tecniche e questo a noi fa molto piacere, fa molto favore e anche molto diciamo così, necessario dal punto di vista eh, diciamo così, la, eh, lavorativo. No? Eh, per fare qualche esempio, no? ritornando ai, ai, ai tempi, tempi in cui eravamo noi giovani, eh, se tu hai eh, molti tutti i ragazzini, diciamo così, che vorrebbero essere Iron Man, ecco, di quei ragazzini c'è il 5% che non mi frega niente di essere Iron Man, ma vorrebbe costruire la tuta di Iron Man, no? Allora, quello lì è il futuro ingegnere, c'è già il germe dentro di sé, così come quelli che non sono tanto appassionati alle scazzottate del Capitano Kirk, ma sono più interessati a, 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 al all'ingegnere Scotti che ripara i motori, oppure al signor Spock che, diciamo così, fa scienza, eh, e, e anche lì secondo me si va, ci si va a identificare su dei personaggi no, che nella, nella narrativa letteraria, cinematografica, eccetera, della fantascienza offre, offre questi personaggi, questi stereotipi a cui, a cui potersi ispirare e su, sui quali poi poter coltivare quelli che magari un giorno scoprirai saranno le tue passioni o addirittura un giorno scoprirai che potrà diventare eh, la tua professione. E questo secondo me è un servizio fondamentale che fa il mondo della, della fantascienza perché questi, diciamo, queste figure di fatto non si ritrovano né nei percorsi scolastici né eh, se non molto edulcorate in termini dello scienziato che, ma eh, non è la stessa cosa della quotidianità eh, né negli altri tipi di, diciamo, di, di filoni narrativi quindi questo, questo collegamento cioè, infatti io quando trovo, magari quando incontro un tesista o un dottorando e scopro che non sa cosa è la fantascienza qua un pochino di, di, di sospetto ce lo sento no? nel senso che dico ma perché sei qui no? è veramente una battuta ma eh, c'è l'altro quindi questo è un, è un aspetto no? in qualche modo c'è l'altro aspetto complementare che è altrettanto importante che in qualche modo va a controbilanciare adesso ci spostiamo no? da, non dall'ispirazione dei ragazzi ma e della ragazza e, e, cosa che un pochino manca ecco, se posso dire eh, nel senso che vediamo adesso ultimamente molte diciamo così, donne di capitano no? di, di nave spaziale poche ingegnere ecco. eh, quindi è un passo in più ancora da fare insomma, e, e che avrebbe una buona ricaduta diciamo, così, sui nostri ragazzi e ragazze eh, ma poi c'è l'altra metà i ragazzi quando arrivano quando varcano le porte del Politecnico la soglia delle porte del Politecnico vengono inondati di tecnologia, di tecnica, di formalismo, di teoria di... e rischiano di dimenticarsi un pochino a che cosa serva questa tecnologia, no? eh, dove verrà utilizzata, eccetera. Ecco, la narrativa di fantascienza ha, secondo me, l'altro grosso vantaggio che mette la tecnologia nel contesto di una società, nel contesto dell'uso quotidiano che ne fanno le persone e quindi permette anche di vedere, senza, diciamo così, annoiare sul piano teorico ma vedere degli scenari, eh, immaginare degli scenari eh, in cui effettivamente la tecnologia è la società, no? cambia la società, plasma la società e viceversa la società plasma eh, la, la, la tecnica e la tecnologia. Ecco, questo eh, chiaramente la libertà narrativa che ha il campo della fantascienza ci permette eh, sicuramente di riuscire a immaginare eh, delle applicazioni, a immaginare dei contesti che chi studia solo tecnologia rischia di dimenticarsi, si rischia di diciamo così, avere poi un approccio che sia technology push piuttosto che non un approccio più, più complessivo, più aperto rispetto allo sviluppo no? eh, armonico no? De, de, de queste, di queste due branche. Ma io non voglio annoiarvi eh, perché non voglio raccontarvi, diciamo così, molte delle cose che ho detto in realtà ricadono nella mia storia personale e io sono qui eh, anche perché eh, la RAI negli anni 70... Eh, permetteva, io ricordo il primo telefilm di fantascienza che ho visto, ero un bambinetto, mi è spaventato, c'era una serie, 
qualcuno ricorda, non voi siete più esperti di me, credo che fosse Orion si chiamasse, una serie di tv bianco e nero tedesca, no? di cui hanno trasmesso quattro puntate, mi sono spaventato a morte nel vedere queste cose perché ero un bambinetto, poi dopo per fortuna sono arrivate quelle più semplici, il post fatto nel 1999, cose di questo genere. Poi c'è stato il, il grosso silenzio della fantascienza per decenni, adesso per fortuna c'è una nuova rinascita. Però si si accende una lampadina che poi riesci poi a coltivare nel resto del tuo percorso. Eh, non vi voglio annoiare altro, sono sicuramente eh, diciamo, contento di vedere che ci sono autori eh, di fantascienza da varie eh, parti del mondo che diciamo, approcciano il tema diciamo, da, da, da più punti di vista diversi, anche io purtroppo eh, non, eh, non riuscirò a fermarmi per il resto della giornata, ma fortunatamente eh, sarà disponibile la registrazione, quindi state pur certi che, eh, che l'ascolterò la, diciamo, in modo eh, molto avido. Eh, grazie di tutto, grazie di avermi invitato Juan Carlos per questa chiacchierata e buona conferenza a tutti. Grazie. No, è da meno preparato. Grazie molto e grazie per tutti questi saluti ai colleghi, ti ringrazio moltissimo. A questo punto inviterei Maurizio Borghi, il mio codirettore Davide Monopoli, a venire qui alla, al palco per eh, un, una breve introduzione a questa conferenza che, come avete capito, eh, ha delle radici, ha dei, dei punti di contatto, ma anche, anche degli elementi di originalità, non solo per Nexo. Prego, accomodate. Sì, eh, qui, sì, Vediamo se la telecamera ci spostiamo leggermente in là perché siamo... Tra l'altro ne approfitto per dirvi che due membri dello staff sono a casa malati, quindi grazie per lo sforzo che hanno fatto in questi giorni e buona guarigione. E, allora, eh, magari se si può spostare solo leggermente la telecamera, posso chiederlo a Giacomo, solo per non essere visto che poi c'è anche la registrazione. Ok, perfetto, grazie mille. Allora, ehm, eh, Maurizio Borghi, eh, co-direttore del Centro Nex dal primo settembre, eh, insieme a Marco Ricolfi, che come vi dicevo è in missione ad Amsterdam e eh, che ci pensa e ci saluta, penso sia la prima conferenza Nex che si perde Marco Ricolfi, anche Mar Maurizio Borghi è un giurista, questo per presentarvi chi è al mio fianco, Davide Monopoli, direttore del, del Museo della Fantascienza del Fantastico, che è stato un partner indispensabile è fondamentale per organizzare questa conferenza che ha vari contributi e vari partner, lo vedrete nel corso della, della giornata. L'obiettivo di questi pochi minuti che vogliamo prenderci è duplice. Da una parte è tradizione che all'inizio della conferenza annuale i codirettori dicono alcune cose su Nex in quanto tale, visto che è appunto un momento annuale di incontro con la comunità Nex e que è quello che faremo eh, io e Maurizio. Dopodiché però ci sarà una seconda componente di questa, di questa breve chiacchierata per spiegare gli obiettivi e il perché di questa conferenza oggettivamente diversa da, nella storia delle conferenze annuali di Nexa. Quindi io partirei, se sei d'accordo Maurizio, con questa prima riflessione, ovvero una riflessione breve, non temete, sul centro Nexa giunto al suo sedicesimo anno di età, quindi comincia a avere, comincia in, in piena adolescenza, e comincio ad avere una, una discreta storia alle spalle e quindi se sei d'accordo Maurizio comincio a dire qualche parola da questo punto di vista, poi passiamo alla conferenza in, in dialogo con Davide. Allora, sono 16 anni di attività, quindi nasce nel 2006, come vi dicevo, nel Dipartimento in collaborazione con il Dipartimento all'epoca di Scienze Giuridiche dell'Università di, di Torino, appunto Marco Ricolfi è il cofondatore e co-direttore da allora e l'obiettivo era emulare il primo centro internet e società eh, che è stato creato eh, a livello internazionale che è il Batman Center for Internet and Society di Harvard con cui eravamo entrati in contatto l'anno precedente perché avevamo ospitato qua a Torino nel maggio del 2005 eh, l'Internet Law Program che era un programma di quattro giorni offerto appunto dal Batman Center che l'aveva offerto in giro per il mondo ma mai in Europa e, e noi eravamo stati i primi a ospitarli in Europa e mh, da quella porta era scattuito poi il desiderio di emularli, chiaramente se con una scala di, di risorse e anche di bravura per carità diversa, emularli eh, in maniera tale da dare continuità alle attività che hanno cominciato nel 2003 col gruppo di lavoro Creative Commons Italia. Quindi nasce nel novembre del 2006 il Centro Nexus su Internet e Società. Da allora in questi 16 anni è eh, cambiato eh, profondamente sia il mondo, perché parliamo, siamo nati prima della grande crisi del 2007-2008, ed è cambiato il mondo digitale in maniera drastica, 
o in tempi più recenti abbiamo avuto anche la pandemia che ha avuto un impatto su tutti, incluso sul centro Next. Proprio in questi giorni stiamo discutendo se gli incontri in presenza, che erano una caratteristica fondante del centro Next, che adesso sono eh, specialmente gli incontri tipici mensili del, del mercoledì di Next, del Next Lunch Seminar, sono ancora poco frequentati, abbiamo ricominciato a settembre, ci chiedevamo se è un, come dire, una cosa temporanea, transitoria, o se effettivamente è cambiato l'approccio delle persone con la partecipazione ai centri, agli incontri in presenza. Comunque la pandemia ha toccato anche noi. La riflessione che abbiamo avviato durante la pandemia, che continuiamo ancora adesso, e questo forse vuole essere, un, anzi è un contributo per questa riflessione, è di chiederci come immaginiamo il, il ruolo del centro Nexa per i prossimi, restando come dire, umili, per i prossimi cinque anni, non parliamo di dieci o di quindici che diventa forse troppo ambizioso, ma almeno per i prossimi cinque anni, perché oggi, ov, effettivamente è cambiato così tanto, noi siamo rimasti abbastanza fedeli alla nostra impostazione originaria e quindi è giusto e penso sia un segno di, di, di vitalità quello di interrogarci se le forme che abbiamo seguito fino adesso, gli obiettivi che ci sono stati fino adesso, siano ancora come dire, aggiornati o se vadano appunto rettificati, integrati, ampliati. Quindi a questo punto di vista, e, e creo questo piccolo ponte per la seconda parte di questa conversazione, questa conferenza è stata pensata anche proprio per aiutarci a riflettere su che cos'è il centro Nexa dopo 16 anni e che cosa vuole essere per i prossimi 5 anni. Quindi da questo punto di vista abbiamo fatto la scelta di fare questo incontro in presenza, abbiamo invitato anche, come qualcuno in platea sa, i nostri fellow, a venire in presenza sia a questo incontro che ai prossimi incontri, perché riteniamo che i rapporti interpersonali si coltivino eh, sicuramente anche online, ma soprattutto in presenza, però appunto è una riflessione in corso, vedremo cosa capita nei prossimi mesi. Mi fermerei qui e passerei la parola a Maurizio. Grazie Juan Carlos, hai, hai riassunto diciamo, la, la, i primi 16 anni di, di Nex, io eh, ho conosciuto Juan Carlos e il gruppo di Nexa all'inizio, poi ho partecipato in, in vari, eh, varie forme al centro Nex e da, da quest'anno sono arrivato in Sali Torino e quindi sono, sono con direttore e rappresento l'altra anima di Nexa, se vogliamo l'anima giuridica. Eh, Nexa è, è, è nato come un centro interdisciplinare, in particolare il rapporto tra diritto e tecnologia cioè eh, due aree eh, fortemente messe in discussione dal, dal, dallo sviluppo tecnologico negli ultimi vent'anni, eh, no? con l'arrivo di internet e così. E, e poi in realtà eh, il centro Nexus ha anche, ha anche altre, altre eh, esperienze, altre, altre discipline che lo, che lo arricchiscono. Eh, allora, questa conferenza beh, è, è nata direi da, da un'idea all'inizio un di Juan Carlos che è stata poi condivisa dal, 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 gruppo, ehm, dal, dal gruppo di Nexa e è, è, stata, è stata elaborata e diciamo che le, ci, ci chiedevamo che cosa, come, come dare un contributo ecco, alla, alla, al, ai temi che sono, stanno a cuore al centro Nexa, quindi internet e società e, e abbiamo visto che Oggi è, um, è difficile assistere a una conferenza su questi temi che non abbia dentro le parole intelligenza artificiale, blockchain eh, o metaverso. E ammetto, proviamo a fare qualcosa di diverso, perché eh, la, la, lo scopo del centro, anche pensando alle evoluzioni future, alla, alla missione futura, è, è anche quello non di, 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 di seguire... Eh, le, 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 ultime, eh, le, le, le ultime cose che arrivano appunto nel, nell'ambito di internet e, e tecnologia, ma provare, non dico ad anticipare eh, tendenze future, ma a, a esplorare temi che trovano meno rappresentanza e meno, e meno coscienza, ecco, nel, nella, e soprattutto nell'accademia, nella riflessione accademica universitaria su, eh, su, su internet e società. E siccome eh, più, più o meno tutti noi abbiamo, abbiamo vari interessi nella, nella, nella fiction, nella fantascienza. Eh, ci è subito piaciuta questa idea e, e grazie appunto alla collaborazione con, con, con Davide Monopoli, con, con, con Lutan, eh, siamo, siamo, siamo contenti di aver, di aver messo insieme insomma, un programma sicuramente interessante e sicuramente 
che, eh, che, che, che darà un contributo soprattutto a noi per la, per la nostra riflessione in quanto, in quanto accademici e ricercatori appunto su, su, su internet societario. E con questo lascerò la parola a Davide. Vuoi dire ancora una cosa? Sì, scusa, volevo ancora prima di dare la parola a Davide, volevo ancora eh, dirvi eh, che cosa abbiamo detto Davide quando ci siamo incontrati per la prima volta, il primo contatto è prima dell'estate, poi successivamente siamo, abbiamo cominciato a lavorare in maniera più approfondita a, a rientro della pausa estiva. A Davide abbiamo fatto che conoscevamo per, per, per tante altre visite, collaborazioni, con Biennale Tecnologia, con tante altre cose, abbiamo fatto il seguente discorso. Abbiamo detto, conosci il Centro Nexa, il Centro Nexa è una comunità appunto, dove ci sono giuristi, ma anche economisti e persone con vari background. Noi vorremmo interrogare la fantascienza e più specificamente la narrativa, quindi abbiamo ristretto il campo in maniera forte perché chiaramente c'è anche la cinematografia e tante altre forme di espressione, quindi la narrativa e, in maniera tale che interrogarla e quindi cercare di ai chiedere aiuto a narratori di fantascienza per mettere a fuoco dei temi de che sono l'obiettivo del centro extra, quindi diciamo tecnologie digitali e società, temi che sono fuori dalla nostra visuale, che non sono particolarmente magari nell'ordine di priorità che dovrebbero avere. Questa è la prima, la prima richiesta. Quindi la prima richiesta è stata che se in platea, non so se sia il caso, ma ci fosse qualcuno che in realtà non ha molto interesse di fantascienza, okay, vorrei che alla fine della giornata fosse comunque contento. Okay? Supponiamo che qua ci sia un ipotetico avvocato che è venuto, che non, fantascienza non interessa molto, che però a fine giornata dica sì, ho imparato qualcosa di interessante, utile per riflettere su tecnologie digitali e società. Questa è la prima cosa che abbiamo chiesto. La seconda cosa che, e quindi anche chi vedrà la registrazione in futuro, vale la stessa cosa. La seconda cosa che abbiamo chiesto, che era emersa in realtà dalle riflessioni precedenti con i garanti del centro Nex a giugno, è stata quella di provare a ampliare lo sguardo, perché con tutti i discorsi che facciamo di postcolonialismo, decolonizzazione e così via, è pazzesco, lo dico da, da persona che segue queste cose ormai da vent'anni, è pazzesco quanto in realtà il discorso sia profondamente, come dire, costruito dal freno originario, poi tutto quanto a seguito, con una visione fondamentalmente nordamericana. Persino l'Europa già arriva in seconda battuta. Quindi abbiamo detto, riusciamo a interrogare eh, scrittori di fantascienza non nord-atlantici, diciamo, non anglosassoni europei continentali, ma anche, no, non vogliamo escludere nessuno, ma vogliamo anche avere una prospettiva, appunto, eh, se possibile, africana, eh, est-asia, latinoamericana e così via. Quindi questi sono un po' i vincoli che abbiamo detto, abbiamo detto Davide, te, te la senti, ve la sentite di aiutarci a costruire una cosa di, di questo tipo, e Davide, sono molto contento che ci ha risposto di sì, e abbiamo quindi cominciato a lavorare eh, al programma, che vedete che ha ingaggiato anche vari altri attori, soprattutto gli editori, che vedrete poi in maniera più esplicita. A questo punto mi taccio e darei veramente la parola a Davide, chiedendogli appunto un po' il percorso che ha seguito per aiutarci a costruire questo programma e cosa ci aspettiamo nel resto della giornata per poi dare la parola al nostro keynote speaker. Bene, sì, grazie Juan Carlos, grazie appunto a uh, Internet, uh, Next Center for Internet Society, sì, come anticipavate voi, insomma... Eh, è stato intanto un grande piacere ricevere ovviamente l'invito, eh, soprattutto per ragioni personali, ma anche perché per certi versi, eh, come dire, abbiamo sentito riconosciuta, insomma, una eh, fra quelle che è, eh, se non la principale, appunto una fra le principali vocazioni del, delle narrazioni fantascientifiche, no? che è proprio quella di, eh, come dire, da sempre dalle sue origini, nel, nella seconda metà dell'Ottocento, ehm, la questione insomma, della tecnologia, no? del suo eh, diventare come dire, un, un, un elemento centrale della vita eh, quotidiana di tutti e tutte, ehm, venga intrecciandosi appunto con il, gli aspetti umani, no? l'umanità e, e il lato appunto, lo human factor. Questo fa la fantascienza, impasta la. la l'attenzione alla dimensione tecnologica con il fattore umano e, e quindi cioè, non sempre voglio dire noi per certi versi lo, lo, lo diamo per implicito ma non lo è assolutamente quindi è importante comunicare che la fantascienza appunto ha, fa da sempre un tipo di lavoro di questo genere e lo fa appunto su più fronti su più media eh, 
si diceva che la letteratura che sarà il focus eh, sul su quale come dire, punteremo lo sguardo oggi, ma poi ovviamente il cinema, il fumetto, eh, oggi anche il videogame e altre forme, quindi il quello che rende anche, almeno a me piace molto, l'altro aspetto della, delle narrazioni fantascientifiche, anche proprio eh, riuscire a esprimere su dei piani, cioè la dimensione tra virgolette alta, insomma, di certa letteratura, ma anche quella tra virgolette di pop, no? si va da Ursula di Kim, appunto a Goldrick. <ride> e eh, eh, a questo proposito, appunto, anche il professor Corno citava prima. Eh, i traumi infantili che noi, come dire, più o meno ci manteneremo subito come eh, spettatori dei fantastici, meravigliosi sceneggiati Rai, di qualità altissima, peraltro, che c'erano in quei tempi. Lo rassicuro perché anch'io ho subito i nostri traumi <ride> a Gamma. Gamma era una, uno sceneggiato molto bello che raccontava di un, un trapianto di cervello e... e era molto inquietato, non c'erano cose ancora le fasce protette all'epoca. Eh, bene, appunto, no? Cioè, quello che faremo. Oh, ecco l'altro aspetto, mi ricordava anche Juan Carlos, eh, decisivo è quello di uscire eh, da quella che è stata, come dire, una vocazione, eh, diciamo, nordamericano-centrica, ovviamente con importantissimi contributi nella storia della fantascienza, ma aprirsi, come dire, nella nell'oggi a, a punti di vista che per fortuna sono eh, come dire, crescentemente anche attingibili no? nel, nel, nel corso del, del nostro incontro di oggi appunto avremo ospite oh, eh, sì. eh, avremo ospiti appunto dal, eh, dal Botswana eh, a Taiwan appunto alla Cina ovviamente gli Stati Uniti e anche dall'Italia e questo per davvero interessante insomma no? vedere come da una parte una dimensione comune, l'innovazione tecnologica che rapidamente si diffonde perché è tutta la parte del mondo venga però reinterpretata dalla, dalle culture eh, appunto diverse e anche mh, prendo ancora come dire, qualche minuto perché mi piacerebbe farvi vedere visto che abbiamo parlato di sceneggiati Rai e visto che è, come dire, c'entra un po' il tema del, della giornata di oggi un rapido estratto di un minuto eh, da una, appunto uno sceneggiato Rai vi dirò poi cos'è che lo faccio prima vedere magari lo, lo faccio partire da qui Ah, ecco, grazie Giacomo, Giacomo, la vedevo. Ho l'impressione che una buona parte... Scusate. Ho l'impressione che una buona parte del pubblico troverà strano che uno scrittore uscito, ma uno scrittore dall'esperienza di capire il trattamento trovi poi una via, trovi una strada nel campo della fantascienza. A mio parere però non c'è contraddizione e ritengo che le mostruosità, i mostri, partoriti da solo dalla ragione, che si rappresentano, che entrano in scena nel campo della fantascienza, non siano poi così diversi da quegli altri mostri, il maggiore dei quali è Ausi, a cui abbiamo assistito nel corso di questi ultimi 20 anni e che non sono scomparsi. La prima messa in onda nel 1971 è il versificatore, racconto concluito nella raccolta Storie Naturali, pubblicata nel 1966. Un poeta commerciale, per capire meglio la chiusura, acquista un avanzatissimo computer capace di scrivere versi. Lirico, lirico, e poi nel quanto che finisce. Filosofico, lirico, filosofico. Salutato, fine cassiva, il centesimo centesimo. No, non è non è mai chiaro. La macchina, potenza di una tecnologia invasiva, è infine di ogni autrice della stessa commedia alla quale assiste tutti. Eh. Ah. Ah. Bene, mi sembra. Ma sono le rive e il resto del vecchio. Ma che cosa le dici? <ride> Thank you. 
Bene, grazie sì, avete riconosciuto Primo Levi, è sempre un piacere insomma, mostrare le sue considerazioni sulla fantascienza e anche far conoscere, perché noi ovviamente lo conosciamo per il suo fondamentale lavoro, tutto che, racco cioè, che racconta esempio, la, la terribile esperienza che ha avuto nel Lager, se forse questo è un uomo e la trepa, ma pochissimi purtroppo ancora oggi insomma, sanno che lui è stato quasi soprattutto uno scrittore di fantascienza, per quantità di... Eh, di Insomma, no, di racconti o anzi che ha tolto. E vi ho fatto vedere appunto eh, un, un estratto da, dai bellissimi sceneggiati Rai che nei primi anni 70 appunto sono stati prodotti dai, dai, dai racconti di Primo Levi e, e di questo in particolare, come avete visto, il titolo è il classificatore, non c'è molto di rispiegarlo, ossia la storia di un poeta che acquista una macchina per scrivere poesie, all'inizio, come dire, c'è un certo scetticismo, perché è divertente e interessante leggere eh, anche appunto il, il racconto, perché c'è crescendo, come dire, di, di legame con la macchina, fino a scoprirne, come dire, la, la vocazione anche, che va ben oltre la sua funzione specifica di quella di scrivere poesie, ma a un certo punto il poeta dice eh, la macchina la usiamo anche per tenere di conto, fare i bilanci, insomma, sopra <ride> altre funzioni eh, interessanti. E, e infine, se per il racconto si scopre che è la stessa macchina ad aver scritto lo stesso racconto. Bene, questo, insomma, riassume, insomma, il, il, il tema che sarà centrale oggi, quello appunto del rapporto tra eh, innovazioni, ovviamente in particolare tecnologiche, e, eh, e l'umanità, no? E questa è la fantascienza e, e, e siamo curiosi appunto, di vedere cosa accadrà. Grazie a Juan Carlos e grazie ancora a tutti per averci ospitato. No, grazie a te Davide. In realtà ti, prima di chiederti di illustrare il programma, quindi di semplicemente questo, sì. per essere la giornata, volevo semplicemente commentare che eh, l'ospezione di Primo Levi quasi sicuramente è stato girato alla SIVA, eh, che è un'azienda chimica di Settimo Torinese dove in realtà Primo Levi molti non sanno per 25 passanni è stato il direttore generale della SIVA che è un'azienda chimica piccolina ma con rapporti anche internazionali importanti e tra l'altro nella palazzina uffici della SIVA Settimo Torinese subito dopo l'uscita dall'autostrada adesso da pochi mesi faccio un po' di pubblicità agli amici di Settimo Torinese ho creato un piccolo museo della chimica pensato soprattutto per le scolaresche, molto molto carino, molto bello, quindi mi sembra un'iniziativa molto simpatica. E secondo commento rapido, prendo la parola a Davide, a Davide Monopoli, che eh, di recente, proprio, proprio in questi giorni, sto rileggendo The Age of Capital di Eric Osborne, il grande storico britannico, e proprio stamattina venendo al Politecnico ascoltavo l'audiolibro che descrive le pagine del progresso tecnologico eh, post 1848, quindi diciamo 1848-1875, che è la grande età della ferrovia del telegrafo, e il modo in cui scrive Hobsbawm, che era un grandissimo, superbo scrittore, il modo in cui scrive in maniera incalzante, travolgente, l'enorme espansione tecnica di quegli anni, straordinaria, con delle personalità anche proprio di grandi imprenditori, alcuni mezzi delinquenti, ma comunque visionari, Capisco perché è proprio in quel periodo che poi nasce la fantascienza moderna, perché effettivamente davanti agli occhi dei contemporanei, tra il 1848 e il 1875, quindi uno spazio di una generazione, è letteralmente cambiato il mondo da diversi punti di vista. E, prego, ti ridò la parola, questo se ci illustri rapidamente il programma e dopodiché poi diamo la parola al nostro fisico. Eh, benissimo, sì, allora nel pomeriggio appunto eh, ripartiremo con una rassegna, come diciamo, la prima di attenzione, assolutamente, <ride> e, e quindi, eh, insomma, diciamo, a partire da questa mattina, chiudendo le nostre introduzioni e presentazioni, saremo eh, con Bruce Sterling e quindi ascolteremo, insomma, il, il punto di vista importante che fortunatamente abbiamo qui a Torino, no? ovviamente dei delle figure più importanti insomma, della, della fantascienza contemporanea e anche proprio dire, non serve dico, basta la parola anche cyberpunk per fortuna eh, si è andati oltre il professor è eh, interessantissimo ci darà sul punto di vista eh, decisivo insomma su, sull'aspetto che dicevamo centrale il rapporto tra umanità e tecnologia società e tecnologia 
eh, dopo la pausa pranzo ritorneremo con, eh, puntando l'attenzione su un'altra dimensione eh, molto eh, presente e molto importante di questi ultimi anni che è la fantascienza cinese eh, che ha avuto un grande boom insomma, nel corso del, del, degli ultimi 10-15 anni insomma, a partire da quando ha iniziato a diffondersi appunto anche in occidente il, eh, ad esempio il, il lavoro di Cicinghiu, che è il problema, il problema dei tre corpi, cito questo perché è semplicemente noto, come dire, anche a un pubblico più ampio rispetto a quello specifico della fantascienza. Quindi saranno con noi ehm, intanto un editore che forse è il più importante cinese per la zona della fantascienza, che è Science Fiction World, e, e poi uno scrittore eh, emergente che è eh, Xie Yuni. E quindi da loro ci faremo raccontare quali sono gli ultimi, eh, come dire, le novità più recenti della fantascienza cinese in relazione al mondo digitale. Eh, dopodiché restiamo in Oriente e quindi abbiamo un secondo appuntamento con il, il mondo della fantascienza asiatica, eh, in questo caso taiwanese, quindi saremo con Cita Wei e a questo ringrazio tutto a di edizioni per averci aiutato, come dicevo anche, anche prima, diversi editori amici che ci hanno aiutato a costruire appunto l'appuntamento di oggi. E Cita Wei è un, è un autore contemporaneo taiwanese e, ci, e lavora molto sulle questioni della, di come l'identità, il corpo e tecnologia Dire, possono trovare i tre interessanti creativi decisivi, no? forse recuperando un po' una prospettiva che è stata anche un po' quella di Donna Haraway, ad esempio, o altre. E, dopodiché faremo un salto dire, dalla parte opposta, quindi incontreremo eh, con l'aiuto di, 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 di un altro editore italiano dire, che lavora con grande qualità che è zona 42, incontreremo eh, Martin Felipe Castanier, che è un, uno scrittore argentino, e eh, Clotro Saramase, che è una scrittrice del Botswana, e, e con loro appunto, continueremo questa avventura digitale, multiculturale, digitale, raccontato, e sarà ovviamente, l'ultimo ma non l'ultimo, l'amico eh, appunto Alessandro Vietti, che è, è un autore appunto di fantascienza italiana che nel corso del suo, di questi anni, insomma, de, de, della sua ricerca, ha puntato la di molto per l'attenzione anche lui sul, sul digitale, raccontandolo, come dire, nei suoi risvolti fantasocio-antropologici, insomma. E, ebbene, qui chiuderemo la giornata di nuovo tra le 5 e mezza eh, e le 6, insomma, un'ora avremo dalle 17.30 alle 18.30 di condivisione comune, che saremo aperti alle domande, a, insomma, a quello che emergerà da tutti e tutte noi, speriamo, insomma. Grazie. Grazie Davide, aggiungo che proprio per raggiungere l'obiettivo di, come dire, estrarre indicazioni utili per la riflessione del centro Nexa su internet e società, per ogni sessione ci sarà un rapporteur, quindi qualcuno che ascolterà con particolare attenzione la sessione, prenderà appunti e poi alla fine, alle 17.30, eh, questo ultimo spazio della conferenza sarà, eh, in, sarà iniziato proprio dai rapporti, brevi rapporti di questi rapporteur per questi quattro momenti che costruiscono il nostro programma. Io per esempio sarò il rapporteur del keynote di, di Booster. Perfetto, grazie molto. Allora eh, passiamo alla sessione successiva. E con grandissimo eh, piacere che invito a venire qua al palco eh, Bruce Sterling. Eh, il grandissimo piacere è, è figlio di, di, molti, di molti motivi. <ride> di molti motivi. Eh, allora, Bruce Sterling eh, ha un rapporto forte con Torino e, e noi lo conosciamo appunto da allora quando venne a Torino con Yasmina che siede qua in prima fila. Ehm, nel, con un invito all'epoca della regione Piemonte, se ricordo bene le memorie dell'epoca, e da allora eh, Bruce e Yasmina hanno condiviso molto del loro tempo e delle loro energie col centro Nexa, e di questo noi siamo infinitamente onorati e contenti, quindi in qualche modo la fantascienza è nelle nostre radici fin dall'inizio, anche se soltanto in questa occasione è messa veramente sotto riflettore in maniera esplicita. E, 
e quindi grazie molto a, a Bruce per questa <ride> sua presenza così sonora e, e per, per l'esordio e ha scelto questo titolo eh, che vedete nel programma che è Fantascienza and Science Fiction in Torino perché sta diventando anche uno storico del, del, dell'Italia, del Piemonte, del risorgimento della nostra città eh, di, di, di tutt'altro che secondo piano e... <ride> e basta, non dico altro, direi che a questo punto il palcoscenico è suo e grazie di aver accettato e buona lezione Hello. Ciao a tutti, uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, I am Bruce Sterling, uh, an American science fiction writer in Torino. And normally when I'm going to annoy the Turinese by speaking English for an hour, I, I usually have some beautiful JPEGs. But in honor of my colleagues from MUFON, I decided to bring some of the Bruce Sterling Fantascienza collection here. But I, I don't have an archive as grand as the MUFON Fantascienza archive, but I do have rather a lot of Fantascienza books, and they'll help me make some of my points here. So, you know, why is there an American science fiction writer in Torino? I'm often asked this, and I, why did you choose Torino? And that did not happen. I was actually asked to come to Torino. Torino chose me, and I was actually brought here by. Italian fantasies of culture and, and uh, you know, art and technology culture in order to attend to their affairs, and that's what I do. And it's not uncommon for American science fiction writers to leave America or for science fiction writers to leave their native country, like Arthur Clarke left Britain and famously moved to Sri Lanka. Uh, Robert Sheckley lived in Spain. Harry Harrison lived in Denmark. Norman Spinrad lives in France. Even Valerio Evangelisti, who was a quite famous Italian fantascienza writer, lived in Mexico. He had like a house in Oaxaca and he used to go live in North America, Evangelisti. So, you know, when, when you're a writer and you're like confronted with another country and a different country's culture, there's like standard things that the literary world wants from you. And uh, Calvino, Italo Calvino, he had this, he had this experience uh, when he was first becoming famous, the Ford Foundation paid for him to go and tour the United States. This is like 1961. So here's this Piedmontese writer in Torino, and he's like working for Einaudi, and he's like writing these experimental novels. He's like, wow, the Americans are shipping me to America. You know, I better pay a lot of attention here. I, I don't want them to feel like they're wasting their money. So he's like writing this careful diary and he like goes to New York, goes to San Francisco, goes to Los Angeles, he even goes to Texas. Like Calvino in Texas, and I happen to be from Texas myself. So he's like going through Texas and he's carefully noting, it's like, this is not like Europe at all. There's like nothing but empty space here, like lots of cattle and like oil, and, and that's all very accurate. But then he was confronted, like, what am I going to say about my American tour? And he said, well, you know, I could write a book which is about being an Italian in, in America, but that's so boring. I mean, everybody writes the standard tour of like, I'm in the foreign country, and like, these are my reactions. You know, it's like, So he never published this book. I mean, he in fact wrote a diary, which was as long as a book. And it was published posthumously after he was dead and really, really famous. So if you read it as an American, it's quite an interesting book. I mean, he knows what's going on, but he just kind of wisely decided not to do that. So I had a rather similar experience in the early 1990s, when I had to go on an official tour of Italy sponsored by the U.S. State Department. Like, okay, why is the U.S. State Department exporting me to Italy? Well, you know, I'm a cultural export, right? I mean, I'm an, I'm an agent of American cultural imperialism. This is, this is my point. They're going to send me from town to town in Italy 
hoping that more Italians will buy more science fiction books from the USA and it will improve the American trade ballots. And you know, it's, it's your basic soft culture, culture war thing. And I had some second thoughts about doing it, but then I, I decided I would go. I mean, I had seen Italy before, but I'd never really done a cultural event of this kind. So I went to many Italian cities and I was like touring in bookstores and, and I wisely said nothing about it. I did not write about how I'd been to Italy. I'm like, oh, Venice, the streets are full of water. It's so different. And I was like, okay, no. I did go to Milan where there were some, there were some science fiction fans or, or rather cyberpunks, uh, guys from the Shake publishing house. They were like Raph, Valvola, and, and Goma. Valvola and Goma. Okay, I got along very well with Valvola and Goma. I had to tell all my friends in the USA that it was kind of happening in Milan that they kind of knew what we were up to. I considered that well worth my while. But then I went back to the United States and thought very little else about it. So what's the difference? between my version of fantascienza, American science fiction, and actual Italian fantascienza. Well, in the United States, in the 1920s, there was an outbreak of popular publishing, which happened because of the cheapness of paper and ink and the subsidies of the American postal system. And that was why pulp magazines came into existence. There was so much timber in the United States that paper was just extremely cheap. And the US federal government had decided to underwrite the postal system so you could move it. You could move paper from like one part of the continent to another very cheaply. And this meant you could publish all kinds of rubbish, which simply made no sense in a European context. It was just very easy to experiment. So there was a, an, an immigrant in, oh, <laughs> there was an immigrant in, uh, in New York City uh, who was an electronics part salesman. And he had these paper catalogs uh, in which he sold radio parts. And he was a technical radio enthusiast. Uh, and he was publishing all these magazines uh, selling his radio parts and telling people how to build radios. And almost by accident, he began publishing some speculative work. It's like, what would radios of the future look like? And he realized that these particular issues of his magazine were outselling the others. So that was Hugo Gernsback, the man who invented the term science fiction. And in his heart, he was always a radio catalog guy. He really didn't want to have anything to do with standard literature at all. Instead, he wanted to sell fiction to the technical subculture that had sprung up around hobbyist radio. Because there were radios all over the United States, thanks to Marconi, among other people. And they were all talking to each other, and he wanted them to talk about his magazines. So he used what he had learned in radio to build a technical subculture of American fans of speculative technical writing. And he would launch magazines after magazines. Amazing Stories was one of his. He did magazines about sex education, about health, about all kinds of radio, electrical experimenter. Periodically, he'd lose control of them. But he was you know, an imperial publisher of a pulp magazine empire. And he managed to get science fiction to take off from a technical background in the United States. <clears throat> That did not happen in Italy. Uh, that was what my what the great science fiction critic Damon Knight called the baloney factory. It's like science fiction as a technical distribution empire. Like, how does it make money? How does it reach its audience? How does it get the ink on the paper? How does it move it? That's the baloney factory. And if you're a science fiction writer, or even a fantascienza writer, you have to come to some kinds of working terms with the baloney factor. Okay? You have to participate in some way. So in Italy, there was in fact a woman 
Roberta Rombelli. It was sort of Signora Baloney Factory. She was the first person in Italy who was a full-time science fiction entrepreneur. She actually figured it out, Roberta Rombelli. She would like get up in the morning, translate some books, publish some books, distribute some books, start clubs, talk to the fans, manage things as a kind of nine to five job. And Roberta very wisely said that everywhere in the world where science fiction or anything like it appears, there's a standard situation. You have people who can write, and have no ideas. And you have people who have ideas but can't write properly. And then you have people who can't write and also have no ideas. And they're 90% of everybody. This is the dominant group within all forms of science fiction, people who can't write well and also think really badly. They're just kind of useless, but they're also the dominant demographic. They're always there. You're never going to get used to them. And Roberta said that at any particular year, there are maybe six people in the world who can actually write well and can actually think well and want to do science fiction. Okay, six among six billion. Uh, what are the odds that one of those guys will be Italian? Not, not particularly high, right? I mean, it's just, okay, that's the, that's the kind of, Roberta's insight there, I think is the historical truth. If, if you look around the world at any particular time and sort of ask, how many science fiction people will deserve to be read in a hundred years, right? Okay, there's a lot. And then there's like maybe half a dozen from this year who, whose work will be remembered in the future. <clears throat> so that's kind of the difference between Bruce Sterling and Bruno Argento. Bruce Sterling is absolutely a product of the heritage of Hugo Gernsback. He's a guy from very much part of American popular science fiction culture, like very historically aware of how all this works and, you know, and very ingrained in the publishing system. Whereas Bruno Argento is actually a fantasy writer, Fantascienza writer in Torino. So how do you know if you're Fantascienza? You know, it's like, okay, you can come up with all these elaborate definitions. It's like, oh, I, I know who, Roberto Rondelli was, but actually you're Fantascienza if you know people in the Fantascienza subculture. You just like go out and hang out with Fantascienza people and they're like, okay, yeah, you're one of us. You have to meet them and also you have to sympathize with their complaints. That's a, it's not enough that you sort of know somebody from Fantascienza socially, you actually have to understand what their problems are. Because, you know, a writer without a problem is like a farmer without a plow. They just, they've got to have cultural problems. So what are Fantascienza's cultural problems? What really bothers people in Fantascienza? And I am bothered by this, or rather Bruno Argento was bothered by this. Doesn't bother Bruce Sterling at all. Bruce Sterling doesn't really need it. But Bruno Argento is a guy who's like willing to tackle these Fantascienza issues. Okay, number one. The number one problem of Fantascienza historically, which dates back to the 1950s, is that it's too American. Right? It's like too American dominated. Okay, why does this problem exist? Why was Fantascienza ever American documented? Well, it's quite a story. <laughs> story, story I know. I'm going to be hard put to stop talking about this because it's kind of the original Fantascienza problem. All right, in Milan, there's this guy, Giorgio Monticelli, who invented the word fantascienza. He's kind of the Hugo Gernsback equivalent. Hugo Gernsback invented the term science fiction, and he even invented the science fiction subculture with its roots in technology rather than literature. But Giorgio Monticelli is a Milanese bohemian. His dad's a wealthy publisher, but his mother is a pretty actress. She's not the wife of his father. She's, she's the mistress of this rich publisher. So he's a guy who belongs in publishing, but he never quite fits. There's something like restless and troubled about him. That people find him very charismatic, but he's kind of opaque and doesn't seem fit for conventional employment. 
His mother dies young, then he gets married and his wife dies young. And also the war wasn't very kind to him. He's like continually having his town bombed and he's just in a troubled situation. So at one point in his life, he's in Switzerland escaping the war damage. And he finds like this heaps of American science fiction products of the Gernsback scheme. And they've been brought over by American GIs who are like science fiction fans. And somehow they've ended up over the border of Italy. And Monticelli happens to be able to speak French and English. He's had rather a good education. Uh, so he discovers all these bizarre books, which like literally nobody in Italy has seen because the fascist regime is not very friendly toward American popular culture. They don't like the newspapers, they don't like the magazines, they don't even like the films. Uh, and least of all, would they like American science fiction. So American science fiction has been produced for a good 20 solid years by the time Monticelli discovers it. And it comes as really a shock as it would be for anybody. I mean, it, there was a similar situation in Eastern Europe in 1989 that when the Warsaw Pact fell, people in the East who sort of see maybe one American science fiction book a year were suddenly confronted with just a mudslide of American popular fiction. So there was a 20 year gap between what had happened in Italy and what had happened in the United States. And Monticelli was a publisher and typesetter and he just knew all about it. And he thought, well, this is gonna be easy. I'm just gonna like translate this stuff and like publish it in Milan and just send it all over Italy. And, you know, and I can get it cheap and nobody's gonna see anything like it. All I have to do is like promote it and make it seem sexy. So he goes back to Milan and he decides to publish science fiction and he starts a science fiction magazine called Urania. Uh, but unfortunately he's an alcoholic. I mean, he's just, he's been a heavy drinker ever since he was a teenager. And, he seems to suffer from a trace of probably bipolarity. There's periods when he's very on top of his game and can achieve like amazing amounts of work in just a week or two. And then there's periods where he's hanging out with his best friend, who's a Ukrainian Italian mystery writer. And being Ukrainian, he's a very heavy drinker. So he's Monticelli's favorite drinking buddy. And the two of them are always going out in Milan and just getting completely blackout wasted. So Monticelli starts his publishing house and he's doing pretty well, but the marriage breaks up. He just has a wife, another wife, and four children by this wife, but she can't put up with him. His, his drinking is out of control. So he falls into the hands of a woman named Muti Malioni, who was the very first. American, uh, very first Italian science fiction girlfriend. Super interesting figure. It's actually Moody who's propping the guy up. She's like seven years older than him. She can see that he's in a downward spiral, but she's also a heavy drinker and she decides to look after him. You know, and, and people who meet Moody Malioni are like, why is this nice, kind hearted Milanese late lady hanging out with this like bizarre character? who's spending all his time in bars and like eating pills and endlessly translating science fiction novels. Okay, for some reason, Moody wants to keep the guy alive. She's just kind of brushing him up and she's a big mystic. She's got nothing to do with science. In fact, she starts a column for a science fiction magazine where she's urging people to guide their lives through the wisdom of the Chinese I Ching. That's Moody Malioni. Charming person, apparently. And he's and, and so he's publishing the magazine. He just asks Moody to start writing sci-fi novels. And she's like, okay, I, I understand this. This isn't a problem. Just like you need like UFOs, rocket ships, some adventure. She like whipped out a science fiction novel in a couple of weeks. And he's also writing Fantascienza novels under the under the name Tom Arno. So, 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 so the two of them are kind of doing kind of okay. I mean, if you look at it objectively, he's in a great situation. All he has to do is continue to publish these things, translate them, send them out to the population. They actually like it. You know, the Italians actually like American science fiction. They consider it exotic and fun. 
All he has to do is show up sober, work nine to five, mind his own business. He's got all the family connections you could want. He's in Milan. He's the center of publishing. Everything ought to go. No, the guy is just, he's just doomed. I mean, he's, he, he can't handle his drinking problem and his, and his mental illness, and he dies young. Okay, that's the actual heritage of Pontescenza, and that was the guy who introduced American science fiction into an Italian context. It didn't work out. Okay, around 1961, a guy who's had more on top of his game, Luno Aldani, he writes this book about American Pontescenza in which he just explains, like, what is science fiction from an Italian perspective. And you read this book, you realize, yeah, okay, he actually gets it. He's kind of on top of the mudslide here. He's not surprised by it. It's like he's actually internalized. He sort of understands what the Americans and the English are trying to do. So, yeah, so he, in 1961, the problem of, of like being actually overwhelmed by American science fiction is gone. And you've got a, a situation where if you're Italian and you're interested, you can kind of take everything and go somewhere with it. Right? And I would point out, Although people say that Italian science fiction is very Americanized, um, Italian gialli, right, like mystery writing and thriller writing, are much more Americanized than Italian science fiction. And Italian Westerns are much, much more Americanized than basically any other form of Italian popular culture. They're like way into Westerns for you know, reasons no Americans can appreciate. But it's not as if it wasn't dominated by American science fiction, because for a while it was. Then there's problem number two, which is Italian pre-science fiction, like imaginative work that Italians were doing before fascism, which was actually something that probably would have turned into a genre eventually, but never did. And there's a book of these, Airships of Savoia. Unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me because I, I have it in I have it in uh, Ibiza, where I periodically go and look in there. And it's kind of, it's kind of like, I wouldn't say a severed limb, but there's a kind of cultural war damage there in that the society actually went through this historical tragedy, and it has a hard time connecting back to, you know, what was a native expression of Italian fantastic writing. You no know, Salgari's heritage, basically, you know, it, it, it doesn't, there's like a break. And then, like, there's, there's just, like, a mental difficulty in connecting with it. And then there's the literary fantasy of Calvino and Levy. Uh, and, you know, in Pontescenza, people are very aware of Calvino and Levy, but they know that they're not Pontescenza because, you know, they didn't hang out with Pontescenza people. They were hanging out with, like, the Ulipo group and, you know, Holocaust writers. So, you know, in the United States, people are actually keenly aware of Calvino and Levy, which is like an enviable thing because, you know, Italian fantascienza writers are not particularly famous in the United States, whereas if you're a Texan science fiction writer like me, it's actually considered a mark of cachet that you're like going to quote Italo Calvino. And I'm like, you kind of know a lot about him. And I was like, yeah, he's like on top of his game. <laughs> Foreigners read them. But unlike Fantascienza, they don't really have any heirs. It's not like a Calvino school of writing. There's not even like a school, a living school of Ulipo writing, like the workshop for potential literature in, in France. And Levy doesn't really have heirs either. There's nobody who wants to write about what he wrote about and sort of, you know, chemistry, fa chem chemical fabulation from Torino. Okay, it's like you can read Levy. I got, got some Levy here. <laughs> Tukey, Riconti, there's a lot. There's like half a dozen that are basically Levy-style literary fantasy. They're, they're not Fantascienza, Tranquil Star, all that. Okay, Americans read that, not as many as read Calvino. But, you know, this is, this is like a rival to Fantascienza that kind of bloomed briefly and kind of left no children. Unlike actual Fantascienza, which has been doing pretty well since about 1957. There's a, Plenty of fantascienza around. Okay, then there's the money, or the Italian version of the Bologna factory, the Monticelli industry that Monticelli could not industrialize. 
And, you know, and this is a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's a severe problem just to be able to afford a genre, right? Because even if you have a publishing house, not everybody is going to want to read Westerns or mysteries or science fiction. And it's just a difficulty to find enough enough uh, economy of scale to be able to afford full-time science fiction people. Like France can do it, Poland can do it, Germany has a few, the United States has a lot, somewhere around 5,000 people who are science fiction more or less professionals. But even in the United States, it's rather common for science fiction people like me to do other things rather than publish science fiction novels. Um, for instance, uh, Jules Verne, inventor of science fiction, as many people say, he wrote a lot of novels. He didn't make very much money from them. He became very wealthy, mostly through theatrical rights. And his biggest hit was not a science fiction novel. It was Michael Strogoff, which is you know, this adventure novel about some czarist cavalry officer. Huge commercial hit in the French theatrical business. It just made a heap of money. Uh, he didn't spend it, he didn't care about money. Mrs. Verne spent it and his son spent it. If he gave him more money, it didn't matter. But nevertheless, the most money that Jules Verne ever made was in spectacular theater shows, not writing sci-fi novels. H.G. Wells, most successful book, Outline of History. Not War of the Worlds, not Invisible Man, none of us, as well as in sci-fi. It was that kind of political stuff. And like his historical thing was the first book of his that was a major hit. Two of my literary mentors, Harlan Ellison and Brian Aldous. Har Harlan Ellison won unbelievable numbers of science fiction awards, all kinds of short story writing, made most of his money writing for television in Los Angeles and working for movies. And when I went to hang out with Ellison and like be taught the ropes of the Gernsback machine, he was like, okay, yeah, you can write sci-fi, but if you want to make any real money, you've got to like somehow get into the TV business. I mean, this is just where it's at. Yeah, just like write some screenplays, you'll, you'll do great, right? And Brian Aldous, who was a, a mentor of mine too, and the author of this extremely interesting book, Billion Years Spree, The History of Science Fiction, his most popular work was actually a memoir of being a soldier in the Second World War, which he was. Hand reared boy and, and soldier erect, they're very little known. They have they're not science fiction at all. And they're they're just basically war, war memoirs, outsold everything else he did. He was surprised, even a little shocked, that he was a a more successful mainstream author almost by accident than he was from decades of working as a Fantascienza writer and critic. That's just how it is. And, and, and in, Italy, in Italy, it's the same. Like Licia Troisi, famous fantasy writer in Italy. She likes being on television. And you look up Licia on the internet, she's a television personality. And Dario Tonani, he's a technology journalist, likes to write for Wire, you know, okay. I'm not saying these are all day jobs. I'm just saying that it's very difficult to do nothing but science fiction. And the same proved true of me. I mean, I, I wrote this nonfiction true crime book, Hacker Crackdown. That was the first time that I realized I was actually famous. You know, I, mean, I wrote Hacker Crackdown. I went to Italy. I was followed by paparazzi. <clears throat> I did not want to write that book in particular, but it was the first book of mine. It was an international commercial success. I and mean, it was just like many, many translations of it. It just hit a public nerve. So, you know, it's, it's a problem that there's a money problem doing science fiction full time and doing fantascienza full time is even more difficult. But in fact, almost nobody really does it full time. I mean, it, it, it's kind of a strange poetic hobby calling. You can lecture, you can teach, you can consult, you can do popular science like uh, Arthur Clarke or, or Isaac Asimov. Uh, and, and you shouldn't be ashamed of that. It seems to have always been part of the business ever since Hugo Gernsback decided to sell radio parts. It's just, there's always some side hustle in the science fiction business. Okay, problem number five, 
distribution. This is a, a, seems to be a, a problem on the Italian peninsula. Even if you are a successful Italian science fiction writer, it's hard to be famous all over Italy. Like famous in Milan, but not too well known in Rome. Nobody in Sicily is going to read you. You can be from Sardinia and a really good Fantascienza writer, except you're from Sardinia. That's kind of kind of a problem because nobody understands you. And yeah, uh, that's just part of the culture of the peninsula. Uh, it's actually hard to be famous as a writer in Italy unless you're famous somewhere else. Like you've got to be Calvino, move to Paris, and then come back, and then they're like, oh internationally famed author, Calvino, we must take him to our bosom. But it is a problem. I mean, and that's something I notice, And that's not true of the United States. Once you're in the bookstore chains in the USA, you're kind of coast to coast. You're all over. Even Texans will read you. Number, problem number six, the canon. OK, you know, this is really an academic problem. It's like, OK, what's really good Fantascienza? If you go in and like write, Look at, at like what Italians say about what's good fantascienza. Mostly they talk about science fiction. Like, well, and particular people in Italy that they really like, like H.P. Lovecraft, Philip K. Dick, William Gibson. Like, okay, like, yeah, these are like the guys who are like good to write. Okay, they're not Italian. I mean, they're not, there's not like an accepted canon of Italian fantascienza that you ought to be reading in order to understand how to write fantascienza. I mean, there are a few people who tackle this, like Julia Yannuzzi. Okay, she happens to be an academic from Trieste, I think, writes a lot about the history of Fantascienza. Okay, I read a lot of Julia Yannuzzi. She's on academia.edu, so am I. Read a lot of Julia. It's interesting that she writes about other stuff besides Fantascienza. She writes about historiography a lot, futurism, the past, you know, sort of genuine public intellectual. And if you had 10 Julias, you'd be getting somewhere, but you only got like one or two. And then number seven, problem number seven in Fantascienza, which is the cultural dimension. It's like, okay, why? Like, wh what's the purpose? I mean, why are you doing this? I mean, you can understand why Giorgio Monticelli would want to do it. He's a publisher and he's found like an easy path to riches. All he has to do is concentrate. But, you know, why would somebody today want to sort of get up in the morning and think, well, you know, the world needs some fantascienza, and by golly, I'm going to write some. I mean, what's the victory condition? What's your exit plan? Right? Like, how do you know you've done a good job? Kind of, what's the point? Okay, well, you know, if you hang out at a place like the Polytechnic or at an event like this, there's kind of a subtext to what we're doing here. Yeah. I could go on all day, but I'm going to choke it down. There's a subtext of what we're doing here. It's like, okay, what's the relationship between Fantascienza and the Polytechnico? Like, why even, why even discuss it? Well, you know, the idea is that science fiction can popularize science. It's like sort of acting as like a soft power front. And it like, it fantasizes about science. It's not science. It's like fantasy science, fantas. But it can also like stimulate the sense of wonder and arouse curiosity and that sort of somehow allows people to move into science and engineering in a more painless way, and therefore we should be kind to them and like ask them to our events and put them on their board of directors or whatever. Uh, but you know, I would have to warn you that this probably isn't true. I mean, there are places in the world with flourishing scientific scenes that do not have a science fiction baloney factory attached. Like there's not a lot of Danish science fiction. There's a little bit, but there's plenty of science fiction writers there. It's not a necessary thing. And also, if you hang out with people who actually are scientists or engineers, they will commonly tell you that they read science fiction when they were 15, but they're not reading any map. I mean, sometimes they write it. But if they have an actual problem, like we're in CERN and we're like trying to discover the Higgs boson, nobody says, you know what we need? We need like some science fiction writers to come in and stimulate our imagination. You know, it's like, our problem is we're not thinking clearly enough, and we just sort of need some of these guys to come in and fantasize about what we're doing, and then we'll like achieve. Okay, no. They're like artists in residence at CERN, like people come in and paint. You would not have a sci-fi writer in residence at CERN. I mean, you could, and he'd be entertaining, but there's no purpose. I mean, it just, it just doesn't seem 
it doesn't seem to work. I mean, people with tenure don't read science fiction, they're kind of busy. So those are the those are the problems of of, of Pontichens, and I'm going to summarize them for you here. Okay, the number one, the American problem. Number two, the heritage problem of pre fantascienza Number three, the literary tradition of fantascienza Number four, the Monticelli industry problem, like the baloney factory problem, of just making it work commercially. Number five, the campanilismo problem of like Italians talking to other Italians. Number six, the canon. You just don't know what's good and what's not good. There's not enough critical assessment. And the last one, sort of the, the cultural issue of like, why are you doing it? It's like, what's, what's the victory condition? And you know, some of these books have helped me with that. And this is pretty fun. Like a nice history of Italian science fiction. I mean, if you're an American science fiction and people say science fiction's too American, you can always point them to Aldous Huxley and George Orwell, these are the two most famous science fiction works in the world. The only ones that are sort of household names everywhere, they're not American. There's not a single American science fiction book, which is actually a household work. And the most, the richest writer in the world right now is J.K. Rowling, who's a British woman who writes about little kids in school, in boarding school, learning about magic. Not a trace of science in there. It's all little kids learning about magic. She's richer than the Queen of England, literally. So yeah, if you're a, if you're a woman, it's either oh, like too many men in science fiction. I'll write J.K. Rowling, richest female writer in the world. Makes up fantasies on her ironing board about, okay, yeah. <laughs> it, it's funny that she's the richest writer in the world. I mean, literally richer than anybody who writes in any other genre, richer than any, richer than Margaret Atwood, you know, richer, richer than any major literary figure, just heaps of money. Anyway, and that didn't make her happy, but that's that's not another problem. Okay, so those are, those are the seven major problems. And you know, what's my approach to this? Well, my approach came from my one of my mentors, Brian Aldiss, author of Billion Years Free. I'm a huge Aldous fan, read almost all his work, even like small press stuff. And I met him on a couple of occasions. And he was talking to me about the relationship of science fiction to world literatures. And Aldous was a disciple of H.G. Wells. I don't know if he met Wells, but he was president of the Wells Society in the UK. And he knew quite a lot about Wells. And the approach of Wells is to like use science to kind of lift yourself above these cultural limitations. That's what the outline of history is all about, the most famous Wells book. You're not identifying with some national tradition or religious or ethnic or political thing. What you want to do is like use the task of science to realize that humans are just one species on one planet, kind of the lesson of war of the worlds. So we're, we're, we're products of evolution and we all have this kind of commonality. And you know, this is what all this also wanted to do. He warned me that. American science fiction writers would write about Mars, but they didn't know anything about Malaysia. So he'd been to Burma and Indonesia. And, you know, and he considered Americans to be dangerously parochial. They just didn't have this global British imperialist idea that the entire planet was just like a place you could like have in your head, right? And you could kind of understand them and outthink them from this kind of astral level of detachment. He wrote a book of essays called An Exile on Planet Earth, which I thought was a very good lesson. I mean, Monticelli is like an ex exile on planet Earth. It ought to work for him. But there's just something wrong with the guy, right? I mean, he has these moments of insight, but he just doesn't fit in, right? He's always going to be an alien. Okay, if you can put the cork in the bottle and not drink yourself to death like Monticelli, and you also don't fit in, maybe you could just like, you know, you'll have, you'll have like the emotional life of a great scientist or a Nobel Prize winner. You're just kind of like be detached from the normal flow, but you're not in an ivory tower. You can actually go and contribute and like maybe think up something original and, you know, hopefully become the Roberto, Roberto Rondelli figure who can actually write and actually think at the same time. Okay. You know, I, I, I listened to this lesson of, of all this is, and I took it to heart, and I traveled a lot, and I, I, I still travel a lot. I, I, I kind of can't help it. 
But instead of having this Wellesian atmosphere of detachment, I wanted much more of a punk do-it-yourself attitude. Like engage with the grain of the material. Like actually put on your journalist shoes and go out and like rub elbows. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, Calvino talks about this. And he, he, he says the, the attitude of the United States toward Italy is that they don't understand the variety of Italian society. They don't know that Italy has the Detroit, but it also has a Calcutta. And this is in the 1960s when the Italian boom was on and Torino was the Detroit. So you've got areas of Italy that are very advanced, very high tech, super well educated, can teach the world, great design value and so forth. And then you have other areas of Italy that seem to be stuck in the past, like Calcutta is, the kind of strangely backward and kind of odd. Okay, this was sort of a, a Calvino's apology to the United States. It's like, look, you're all space age, but you don't realize we have like this Calcutta issue. But in point of fact, historically, what happened was that it was actually Detroit, which was a historical problem. Like the Detroit and the USA is basically a wasteland now. It's really, really bad. Whereas Calcutta, if you go there, Kolkata, actually looking pretty good by Calcutta standards. I mean, it's a modern Calcutta, right? It's got like internet, you know, everybody's got a phone. It's still a Calcutta, but it's not like a sump of Calcutta. On the contrary, it's an actual 21st century Calcutta. And the 21st century as we have it now looks a lot more like Calcutta than it does like Detroit in 1961. I mean, Calcutta, Calcutta was actually the victor in this, in this, in this historical struggle. Uh, so what do you do? Well, okay, I went to Italy and you know, I was asked to go to Torino, so I'm like intensifying my involvement with the Fantascienza community. I'm hanging out with editors, publishers. I like go to the events, been to Trieste, you know, go to Luca, watch the flying saucers land. There are particular ones I was close to, Giuseppe Lippi in particular. Okay, he was like the heir of Urania. He's actually written about Monticelli. He's Monticelli's direct heir. He was nowhere near so messed up as Monticelli. He's actually a, a kind of typical editor. And I had a number of discussions with Lippi about the differences between Fantascienza and, 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 and science fiction and sort of what you could do. And it was, I think, a, a kind of fruitful editor-writer relationship. Like, okay, what seems to be going on here? And, and, and I learned things from him that were interesting. And then I, I thought, okay, well, I'm in, I'm in America and I'm in Italy, but I, and I could write about Italy for the American audience, but isn't that like Calvino's problem of writing about America for the Italian audience? Why don't I write about Italy for the Italian audience? I mean, why don't I actually write some Fantascienza? And like, why don't I write for Italian publishers and for the Italian readership and forget about being American at all. In fact, why don't I take on a pseudonym because everybody at Fantascienza seemed to want to do this, like Rocky Ducks and uh, Tom, uh, Tom Arno, and uh, even uh, Roberto Rabelli was not really her name. It was Yola Rabelli, and she named herself Roberta for some reason. And, and when she wrote novels, she, she was Robert Rambell. Oh, and, there, and, and there's a Fantascienza writer in Torino, actually, uh, Mariangela Ceruti, who amazingly was writing historical novels about the USA. Oddly, I have never met Mariangela Ceruti or Mary Cherry, as she liked to call us. I have never met Mary Cherry. I don't, I don't know anyone who, who even has met Mary Cherry, even though we're in the same town. It's a bigger town than you would think. But you know, if Mariangelo Ciruti can be Mary Cherry, then Bruce Sterling can be Bruno Argent, right? I mean, it just, because it's typical, right? I mean, it's not even an unusual thing. It's actually the standard thing to write Fantascienza with this sort of phony baloney English lacquer. Okay, I can do that. I'll just like do it in reverse. I'll just turn the machine upside down and I'll start writing these Bruno Argento stories. So, you know, I, I do write a lot of Bruno Argento stories, but I'm still much more famous as Bruce Sterling, right? This cyberpunk book here is a book with no English language equivalent. This is actually a huge omnibus volume of like 
three cyberpunk novels and a cyberpunk story collection. And it has a Bruce Sterling introduction, which I'm writing at great length, two Italians about what it was like to be an American cyberpunk and sort of how that came about. And that, that translation has never been in English. I, it's, it's not even for the English market. So Bruce Sterling is still a famous American science fiction writer, but Bruno Argento is actually an active Italian fantascienza writer. He hangs out with Italian editors. He like writes on Italian themes. He's even a Turinese connectivist. He actually belongs to an Italian movement within science fiction, right? Like he's like a contributor to new heterotopias, which is like the latest connectivist definitive anthology. Everything they do is definitive. I don't know. <laughs> Connect the Beastie guy, they're kind of adorable. You know, Sandro Battisti, Giovanni Debateo. Okay, I, these are guys I take seriously. They're actually my editors. I actually commissioned this work. Right? A, a story in here, Robot Fralero, is a, it's a Bruno Argento story. It has to be set mostly in Rome rather than Torino, but it's definitely a Bruno Argento story, which is definitely a connectivist style of story. And I think it's one of my most successful recent works, actually. People in the United States who have read this work, Robot and Roses, as it's called in, in English, are really floored by it. They, you know, they, they recognize that it's a Bruce Sterling story, as like in English, and like does some a lot of exposition and dialogue, and like Bruce Sterling does a lot of this. But it's all about European art criticism of robotics, which is not an American topic at all. And if you're an American reader and you're reading this Bruno Argento story in its original English, it's truly an eccentric work. I mean, it really hits from left field in a kind of intense Umberto Eco style way. It's just about a set of topics common enough, enough in Europe, but just not very well known at all in the USA. Um, but not extremely popular. I mean, Bruno Argento is never, probably never going to be as famous as Bruce Sterling. I don't see how that's possible. Bruce Sterling has written 12 novels. Bruno Argento writes maybe one story a year. They're molto pensato. I mean, they're really like very complex, dense stories about the Italian predicament. They're kind of super Italian. They're like Italian in a way that spaghetti Westerns are American. Right. They're like more Italian than Italian stories can actually be. And I kind of exaggerated in almost Tex Willer kind of way. You know, and they're, they're, into a, they're into a space of cultural appropriation and recuperation, which is problematic in a lot of ways. But, you know, I, I do them, and I think they really are Fontaine's. I mean, they happen to be a kind of simulated American Fontaine's. But they bear the relationship to Fantascienza that a lot of early Fantascienza did to American science fiction. They're actually kind of repaying a cultural debt. And from Torino, I mean, a lot of them are Turinese. There aren't a ton of Turinese science fiction people. Turinese don't actually like cyberpunk. Milanese like cyberpunk. Turinese like steampunk. They like a little Turinese steampunk book published in, you know, in Turin. They don't even like skyscrapers in Torino, obviously. They like to dress up like steampunks here. The very Resorgimento Museum in Torino, they're, they're not even as sci-fi as Luca or Trieste. But nevertheless, I'm a Turinese connected as Fantascienza writer, and I don't think I'm going to quit. And I might die, but I, I'm actually kind of into it. And I, I've like become a participant for some reason. Okay, now I'm going to conclude, which I've kind of got to do here, with a counterfactual speculation. I'm going to like do some like sci-fi for you here. Uh, okay, so you you understand about Bruno Argento, this like peculiar guy. He's like kind of you know showing up in Torino. He decides that he's going to like not even go native. He doesn't acculturate. He's just appropriating. But he's, he's doing these, these kind of harmless, inventive things to, to sort of wake himself up and like break the tedium. All right, imagine, I mean, and, and, it may, and it may seem sort of like odd and useless. It's like he's just got cluttering up the field. And I was like, why, why is he doing this? It doesn't pay. People, are, he's not conquering the world with this. It's some kind of bizarre Turinese hobby. All right, imagine the evil Bruce Sterling. 
the dystopian Bruce Sterling. He knows everything that I just told you about the situation, but he's much more ambitious and in a rather cruel and self-aggrandizing way. Instead of coming over and bowing the knee to all these fantascienza writers and befriending them and behaving like them, he decides he's just gonna take them over, right? They know if they were like weak to American science fiction in the 1950s, or why can't he just like buckle them over, right? So he's backed by the world's two most sci-fi influenced billionaires, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Okay, Elon Musk is obviously a guy super into science fiction. He's always quoting it. And Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, is actually a science fiction bookstore seller. That was his original job with Amazon. He's trying to sell sci-fi books. He knows a lot about sci-fi. So Bruce Sterling decides to ingratiate himself with these contemporary global mobile figures. He just asks not for much, just half a billion from each. Half a billion from Elon Musk, half a billion from Jeff Bezos. They're never going to miss it. Like, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to make the world safe for the ambitions of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, and I'm going to use the Italians to do it. Right? I mean, what do you really guys really want to do? Well, you know, we want we have private rocket ships, and we want Americans to we want the world to go to Mars. Just, all right, we're going to get the Italians to help. We're just going to take over the advantage ends of business. Okay, with my half billion, I just start methodically solving the problems. All the problems that I mentioned. Okay, problem number one. I'm going to engineer this away, like Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Okay, I got my billion. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay, problem number one, too American. No, super American now. Forget it. I've got CIA backers here. I'm just, I'm taking over the thing. America's the way forward. I'm gonna prove that. That's that, that's actually a virtue in my eyes. It's gonna be like super Americanized at the end of this. Number two, the Italian pre-SF thing, the airships of South, forget it. That's superstition. We don't need that. I'm not gonna actively repress it. It's just when I'm done, everybody's gonna recognize that it's hopelessly outdated and superstitious. So just go and get over it. Problem number three, literary fantasy, Calvino, Levitant, stand up, don't have any. I don't need anything. To, I might need some guys of their caliber, I'm going to hire them. But these guys, you don't need them. No, they have no influence. Number four, the money, I've got plenty. I'm just going to buy the distributors. I'm going to buy a television station. I'm going to start hiring people, putting their works on Amazon streaming. I'm going to use Amazon for everything. I'll just obliterate the standard Italian publishing fair. I'll go over to a book fair. Anything that raises its head above water, either cut it off or buy it. Knife the baby, steal the oxygen, take over and Amazonize Italian publishing. It'll make more money. It'll get more books and the more people say it's faster. I'll, I'll buy the trucks. I'll send them to every home. I'll put Alexa in there, whatever. I'm, you know, the standard thing, right? And I'm going to upgrade it. And this is your future. I'm going to promote it and glamorize it. Just get rid of all the, you know, tiresome, small press, weirdo guys. I don't need them and I don't I don't have to afford them. Distribution, I just buy the trucks. Let's take over. Uh, the Canon, it's my Canon. It's all about going to outer space from an American point of view. It's like engineers, central, whatever. Uh, and number seven, the, the other dimension of popularizing science, like why do we do this? Okay, yeah. This is kind of a polytechnico uberales approach. I'm actually gonna, uh, I'm going to educate a coming Italian generation in SDM studies. You can forget the art, you don't really need that. Science, technology, engineering, math. I want to use science fiction to in inculcate and indoctrinate the coming generation and turn them in to Musk and Bezos employees. You got plenty of talent to do it, you got all kinds of skills. You work cheap, right? And, and, and if I manage this like cultural Anschluss, you'll actually probably prosper. I mean, you'll just like be coca colonized as the French used to call it. Okay, that didn't in fact happen, but you're flirting with it when you mess with stuff like this, okay? I mean, it's possible to do this. This is why science fiction thrived in the Soviet Union when everything else was repressed. 
science fiction does very well in China, where you know it, it's somehow seen as like a way to technologize the society without bringing up unfortunate humanistic studies questions. Right? Yeah, that could have happened to you. It hasn't happened yet, but you know it's plausible. It's actually more plausible than being Bruno Argento. Uh, being Bruno Argento is like some kind of situationist stunt. It's like something like a guy from Wu Ming would do. You know, Wu Ming, these Bologna weirdos, five English. Okay, they're super fantasians. Really Italian. I don't know how fantasians. They write fantasians without being fantasians. But you know, being you know, if you get it about Wu Ming, then being Bruno Argento is pretty easy. Right. And it's not, it's not any kind of major, major effort. Uh, yeah, so that's a, a rather dark scene. I mean, that's literally a dystopian scenario, but like being confronted by a Bruce Sterling who doesn't have your best interests at heart. And right? yeah, okay, is that actually going to happen? Probably not. Um, I'll give you a few more upbeat things. I don't want you to leave thinking that all is doomed here because it's too sure at ease. <laughs> What about the future? Okay, yeah, what, what about things that people don't expect? What do I think is going to happen to Fantascienza and probably, to some extent, science fiction too? Okay, I'm going to rattle off just a few of these because I've got two more minutes. Okay, number one, which I think is kind of the black swan, is neural network machine translation, GPT-4. Okay, I'm using more and more of this stuff. I mean, I used to read, I can read Italian, so I'm like pouring through this carefully, but you know, occasionally I use machine translation on stuff. But now I'm machine translating Hindi, Mandarin, Japanese, Korean. You know, and in the labs at Facebook, they've got like handheld stuff that's going to do like 90 different languages in real time, maybe through your ears uh, or with headphones, earbuds, whatever. Okay, literature has never been in a situation where that works. We just never have. And they, they don't write original works about GPT-4, but they're very different. And, and the, the social impact these things are going to have on literature is, I think, underappreciated. Um, okay, issue number two, there's a couple of books recently called Fanta Hyphen Shenza. Fanta hyphen Shenza number one and number two, uh, which are actual attempts to go into places like the Politecnico, talk to scientists, and then commission science fiction writers to write fiction about what they're actually doing. Okay, this is a thing that people have tried to do in the United States. It doesn't seem to work very well. Um, in Italy, Fanta Shenza hyphen one, one and two have actually done pretty well in the Fanta Shenza community. I mean, I, Italians are like reacting with unusual vigor to this. And I have a story in Fantascienza number two, which is about Italian robots, which I think is one of my better, better stories recently. But, you know, if you wanted to sort of put your money where your mouth was at the Turin Polytechnico, you would have the Polytechnico commission Fantascienza number three and just like make it all about stuff in the Polytechnico. And yeah, just kind of come on in there and like do it. You can look at the others and if you like that, you could do that. And, it seems to be kind of working better than I expected. Um, another issue, okay, it's it's this. I mean, it's really this, you know, this strange Calvino literary art and science problem. You now, Brian, Brian Aldous said that although there are some great science fiction novels, there's never been a science fiction novel which is a great novel. And I think that's true. I mean, there just aren't any literary classics which are science fiction. And in fact, I don't say science fiction should be more literary. I have many argues about, arguments with my colleagues about this, but I, I think science fiction should look more like an intelligence briefing and should not be too flowery and kind of humanistic. But nevertheless, if anybody was to resolve that particular problem, I think the Italians actually have a pretty good shot at it. And you actually might be able to, to um, to uh, uh, transcend this issue of genre and literature uh, in, in a more graceful way than, than other people can. <clears throat> so um, how, can I, how can I phrase this last thing? Uh, when you imagine 
when you can't imagine how things will change, it doesn't mean that nothing will change. It means that things will change in ways that you can't imagine, right? Like you, if you don't know what's going to happen, that's not a bad sign. I did not really ever plan to be in Turin, right, in Fantascienza. But it's been one of the most satisfying things that ever happened to me. And even a kind of personal liberation. It's like a black swan that arrived in my life that had the beauty of a swan. It was like actually kind of fun and different and interesting. And in Italy, this kind of makes more sense than it does in other places. Like, Cavour's message of hope was that someday there would be vast convulsions. Like the vast convulsions in Europe that will liberate Italy. And we're going to have to live under the boot for another millennium unless there are vast convulsions. And you know, the vast convulsions indeed arrive. Like convulsions of liberation. And I was like, after the liberation, we were kind of like better. And I was like, it's not like we weren't scarred and killed, but like our life is actually kind of. Yeah, okay, that's a good thing to keep, a, a good thing to keep in your mind. And then last, Fantascienza, although it's never been very big, has commonly been steered by quite small groups of people without much money, but with kind of a good idea. Like, there's more than enough people in this room to completely reform Italian Fantascienza. If you actually had means, motive, and opportunity, and a little bit of a budget, and you knew what you were doing. You could like turn it on its heel and make it do kind of whatever you wanted. There just aren't that many, and not that many people care. But it's not like American publishing, which is big, but also like an oil tanker. It's just very difficult to make it go anywhere. Whereas Italy is a lot more nimble and can kind of do things on the small to medium enterprise level and like make a big difference in a short, a short uh, period. And also, even though Fantascienza has never been as popular as some other forms of Italian popular fiction, it doesn't go away. It's like actually old enough now to have a museum with like a lot of stuff in it. Oh. And there are like 180 Fantascienza writers who are famous enough to be in Wikipedia, which is, you know, kind of a lot. I mean, it's not 6,000 like in the USA, but it's not like five, like rather. Rather, you know, a substantial contribution. So, you know, that, that gives me a, a sense of encouragement. You know, I think things may go pretty well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much to Russerling. I won't say a word after a keynote like this. Uh, we are taking a lunch break and we'll be back uh, at uh, half past um, one. Thank you.
questa seconda sessione insomma, della giornata. Come dicevamo questa mattina, il programma è eh, sentire insomma, a proposito del nostro tema centrale che è come la fantascienza racconta, eh, offre il proprio punto di vista diciamo, eh, di, di um, umanistico eh, circa le innovazioni tecnologiche e facendolo da una prospettiva uh, multiculturale, insomma, in questa seconda fase della giornata, uh, ascoltiamo uh, scrittori e scrittrici uh, dalla Cina, come fra pochissimo, dal Sud America, da Taiwan e, e dall'Italia, ovviamente. E in questa prima sessione uh, siamo con. Cie um, Yunni, che è uno, uno scrittore uh, di fantascienza uh, cinese, e, e, e um, con la casa editrice World Science Fiction Magazine, che è la, una delle più grandi, se non la più importante casa uh, editrice cinese. E, e a rappresentare la World Science Fiction Magazine c'è Yang Gu Yang, che è l'editore, uno dei, dei curatori editoriali della, della Cadentrice. E Giorgina, se mi senti, io inizierei. Sì. And so we are very pleased to meet uh, um, Xie Yunni. Thanks, hi, Xie. Xie Yunni, hi. Xie Shang, ni hao, ni hao. Ni hao. 你好，欢迎欢迎参加Nexa数字化的未来的会议。呃，今天我们想听你的意见，因为我们想呃知道呃科幻所知中国科幻所知呃说数字化，所以呃请说话你的意见，谢谢。好的那我开始啊开始吧啊我今天演讲的主题是未来事件的数字化生存我写过很多科幻小说在小说里面畅想了未来元宇宙的一种未来它真正的吸引人的并不是一个和现实平行的一个虚拟事件人类在里面生存而是一个更高阶的世界它能让参与者能感受到十倍甚至是数十倍于真实事件时间流速的超频元宇宙只要参与者戴上他的头盔他就能够感受到更多的信息通过物理的方式去欺骗我们的大脑我们的器官让参与者完全感受不到不一样完全能够浑然不觉的生活在一个时间被加速的事件中这样一来所有会拒绝在相同的生理时间里去获得更广阔的精力这无疑变相的延长了我们自己的生命这个就像是等一下学云宁我翻译英文谢谢好的学云宁 was um was telling us that these years and these days specifically in China the concept of metaverse and universe uh in science fiction literature are strictly connected uh, one to each other and they are um hot topic in science fiction uh, because they are mm, not only they are connected uh, universe and metaverse but mm, in his works he deals with the the topic of the the feeling of people like uh, becoming more and more immersive in uh, metaverse rather than universe Indeed, in his novel, uh, The Child in the Ripples of the Universe, um, he would have never imagined th the future of metaverse. But probably the reason why people are interested 
in future metaverse might not be only because of the parallel world they are able to live in there but so it's not only the virtual reality but the way the metaverse makes you assess to much more immersive uh, experiences than the real ones未来事件因为大部分人都生活在了元宇宙这样人类需要的消耗的功耗反而减少了这样只需要很少的能源也许一次新能源的革命就能够解决全世界人所有的能源问题这样世界能源的消耗还有包括我们的污染问题都能够得
higher level of spirituality, want to grow in terms of personality and enjoyment, uh, they still need to spend uh, bitcoins, so virtual money, cloud bitcoins, to purchase their virtual goods. And so the circle starts again, is back. For the acquisition of uh, cloud bitcoins, people usually need to use their creativity and their wisdom to create interactive novels that can keep them alive. Ha terminato. Grazie Giorgia. Sì, vorrei, I, I would like to, to jump back to reality and also I would like to ask to uh, Yang Go Liang um, because of his role as uh, uh, chief editor of the so important um, editor like science fiction world. And uh, first I would like to have um, his impression, and I would like to ask him, um, how does China apply today's digital technologies in people's lives? So I would like to start from reality of uh, um, China relationship with digital technologies. Grazie. Um... The Iga Wenti is um, Yang Duoliang Xuexian, uh, Ke Huang Shi Jie Shu Zhu Zhu Ren, um, Huan Yi, Huan Yi Tsan Jia, um, Nexa, Hui Yi. Uh, the Iga Wenti is um, Zhong Guo. Um, Zamazan <coughs> 数字化已经不是未来，而是现实了。其实数字化对我们的影响非常大。我们这本杂志是能听得见吗？信号不太好，对吧？听听听得好吗？呃，我我能听到到你。好的，好的，请请继续。好的，呃，数字化其实对我们的影响非常大。科幻世界这本杂志，呃，是中国销售量最高的一本科幻杂志，曾经也是全世界发行量最大的杂志。科幻杂志，呃，但是我们有一个非常明显的，呃，销量的
uh, each other and to stay connected to to the whole population, basically.第三种的话呢um, he keeps on saying that um, digitalization itself changes, uh, completely changes the, the way of producing stuff and new ideas, innovative com in concepts. In particular, we have we, we can distinguish two uh, separate areas uh, of digital di digitalization: the products uh, we we use on a daily basis, like uh, our mobile, our our devices uh, that are. Um, allow us to be connected to universe and metaverse but also the design in china uh, for instance the technologies and the design related to dig digitalization um, keeps on developing and improving a lot and it's spread all over the world and um, it's considered innovative everywhere and it definitely changed the society the approach to society 数字技术是我们所有人都关心的事情主题就是赛博朋克的专辑，而且和传统的呃赛博朋克的主题不一样。中国的科幻作家写的赛博朋克的主题还会涉及到呃当下最近这几年刚刚发展出来的一些新的呃人工智能的技术，比如说大数据、
I remember that she, uh, Sia Jia, worked in uh, this field or produced some works about these themes. Thanks. Just a moment. Um, Davide, um, Dulin, Bowu, Guanda, Juren, Tashuo, uh, Handuo, Handuoren, Dwe, uh, Zai, Zai, Ojo, Handuoren, Dwe, Jongwo, Ke Huang, uh, Fei Chang Gan Xin Chu, um, Zai, Ke Huang Jong, uh, Shu Zi Hua, Fei Chang Jong Yao, the Hua Ti, um, uh Kersha 这篇小说就恰恰是一个关于数字化未来的它也收在了一个英文选集里面就是这个小说它其实就是一个关于数字化未来和中国人生活密切相关的这么一个故事。Digitalization in, um, in science fiction literature in China is particularly present and it's a relevant topic uh, specifically in Xiaja's work, as you, David, as you said, and in Yang Wuliang's opinion, uh, Chinese authors' <coughs> imagination about digitalization and the future of digital is uh, somehow unique because these works are more um, willing to imagine a world where human and digital technologies coexist. Uh, although in most novel works, um, the path to achieve this coexistence is not like a strict line, it's not that regular, but it's a bit bumpy, it's a bit hard to achieve. But from a general perspective, uh, this kind of imagination of coexistence between humanity and um, digitalization is uh, less pessimistic than cyberpunk. Um, the, uh, the example of Xia Jia, uh, Xia Jia's work, which is uh, the Ling Yin Temple Monk, uh, this, this work was published uh, in 2021 from Science Fiction Publi Publishing House, uh, where um, uh, he works for. In, in December, so around one year ago, and the story uh, was uh, formally published in English in the English anthology titled uh, 12 Tomorrows. And the, um, uh, in the novel, um, Ling Yin Temple is imagined to be like an organization uh, with high technologies and huge funds. And they hope to make technology uh, serve the public, the public interest. Uh, so to be a, a great and good positive help to, mm, to support public um, organizations. So it's not against, it's not a evil, not an enemy. 
and here the the main character uh, reveals that um, his former identity uh, was of a kind of a volunteer worker at uh, Lingyin Temple. So this means this is the connection between spirituality and technologies. So using technologies for a good reason, for with a good um, aim. Uh,很多的科幻小说,它都会设置正反两派,一个好的一个坏的。啊,但是包括很多的科幻小说会把技术,呃,产生一个不好的未来。呃,但是下家作为一个中国的科幻作家,他做了一个思考,就是希望能够
children in the ripple of the universe, as you told, you spoke of, of the metaverse. And uh, I would like, uh, you, you gave us some examples about your idea uh, of uh, metaverse, but we would like uh, to have um, you, we would like you summarize for us your the idea of metaverse of metaverse you uh, express in in your book first. Which kind of metaverse uh, express your novel? Uh, um, the child in the red balls of the universe. Uh, woman in Gai Zidao and Nin Ruha Susiang, Yuan Yu Zhou the Wei Lai.元宇宙的未来肯定是我们就是共同的一个未来星球非常的遥远没那么多在意这可能是我一直比较担心的也是我小说里面经常讨论的话题 um, the, the topic of the metaverse um, has been deeply analyzed in my, in my work um, the, the ch children in the ripples of the universe and it expresses how um, metaverse and universe both exist in human, in people's lives. And um, he can, he uh, had the, the feeling and the, 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 not only the feeling, but also the, the proof, uh, the real, the concrete proof that um, nowadays people uh, want to experience more and more uh, in terms of uh, feelings, in terms of uh, new adventures and things to discover. So we always want more. And the more we can get from reality, we already got it somehow. So the, the next um, place to explore is Metaverse. And that's why the experiences in metaverse we can now we can now live are uh, more are immersive, more immersive than the real ones. Um, but there's we need still to remember that outside there's still a world that can be discovered by us, and it's always different. So we should. Um, find like a balance between the outside and the inside. Uh, sure. Uh, anyway, uh, Unique, I was thinking that uh, uh, today um, we, for certain aspects, celebrate uh, the 30th the anniversary of uh, um, 30 years, uh, the birthday um, of Metaverse, which was born in a novel in the 1992 uh, from Neil Stephenson, whose title was very known and is Snow Crash. And I, um, everybody can say that uh, that novel 
was uh, clearly um, a, a, a dystopy. Uh, what, um, and so it was uh, um, underlined um, negative aspects of also of uh, um, life in metaverse. So I would like I would like to ask you uh, to um, tell us uh, of particularly uh, of this this shadows aspect of this uh, negative aspect aspect in uh, using metaverse or if in your novel are uh, underlined this negative aspects and not just positive. Danisha, uh, just a moment. Mm, the uh, Argo Wenti is a woman to Zutao, Zunian, uh, Sansunian, the Jonian, in way, um, Ijo Jo R. Stevenson, uh, Swaja, the eager Tashwa, um, Yuan Yu Jo, the Huati. Uh, Ta Yuan Yu Jo, the Yijian, she fetam beguanda, she folding the, uh, Shui, uh, woman, Xiang Zidao, uh, Weishama, uh, um, Hada Yuan Yu Zhou the Yi Jian Shi Bei Guan De He Zama Shema Shi Gai Bian Xian Zai Yuan Yu Zhou Bu Shi Tai Bei Guan De Shi Yi Wei Shema Zhou Wei Ge Ke Huan Zhou Zhe Wo Shi Yo Yi Dian Zhi Ji De Xiang Fa Jiu Shuo Yi Wei Ke Huan Xiao Shuo Bi Xu 创造冲突，吸引读者，就说如果他是写一个很美好、很没有戏剧冲突的未来的话，可能读者不一定会喜欢。另外一个科幻是给大家提供一个思想试验，就说他会把一些极端的情况反映给读者，让读者去思考。他描写一个非常差的宇宙，也许会让读者尽量去思考，去避免这样一个宇宙。而真实的事件肯定是按一种比较平衡的方式发展，它也不会更坏，也不会非常好。我是这样理解的。Um, his thoughts regarding the the fact that in the past the um, the common thinking of metaverse was quite negative rather than uh, nowadays feelings which are more positive and hopeful uh, is because of readers. Readers changed. So, and, and they're thinking uh, about society as well. We now live uh, in a... Um, kind of pessimistic uh, but real situation uh, which is the the current the, our current world and the the perspective the world has in, in the imminent future so uh, the readers now need to uh, escape from this feeling and still uh, being able to hope to to have hope so it, and, and until we still believe in a um, positive metaverse, in a positive future, somehow we are able to uh, to keep ourselves alive and to to go on struggling in the real world. Um, so once we we were used to read a critical. Um, negative situation negative scenarios and critical scenarios but now they are considered completely different and that's why the uh, the main vision of uh, metaverse has changed a lot from negative to positive thanks you Ming, also for your interesting a Chinese edition of Snow Crash to have shown us and uh, uh, 
，我们看过中文的呃、uh, Snow Crash， 谢谢你， yes. 你看过我们。Uh, anyway, you uh, uh, we spoke uh, about readers. This is a very interesting um, uh, matter for us. So, uh, cons also considering that uh, uh, science fiction world is, uh, um, as we said, the main editor in China and probably one of the bigger in the world. We are very. Curious uh, to know um, um, which are the re re the readers of science fiction in China. We would like, if, if it is possible, to have some details about age, about profession, about gender. Uh, thanks, and obviously, I'm asking this to a young Go Yang. Um. 因为我们说读者，呃，我们都觉得，呃，这是非常重要的话题。所以问题是，呃，杨多良，你是呃很有名的，你你在嗯非常有名中国呃世界书著的嗯的之一，你在那里？呃，工作的很多年，所以我们呃想知道，嗯、呃，读中国嗯、呃、科幻世界数字是谁？嗯、呃，我们对你们的读者嗯、呃、嗯很感兴趣。呃，他们是谁？他们多大？他们做什么工作？嗯、um, ，听，我们听得懂，不听好。哦，呃，现在可以了吗？挺好、啊。中国的呃科幻读者大部分是青少年，呃，也就是从、呃、七七十七十年，你说？呃，青少年，青少年，啊、少年哎，从十五六岁到二十五六岁，这个数量是最多的。呃，但是呢，现在。跟以前不一样了。今天的中国的读者，呃，年龄非常非常的广。呃，我们现在专门在杂志出了一个少年版，就是专门给小朋友看的。呃，也就是，呃，七岁到十三四岁他都可以看。同时呢，我们另外一部分，呃，像以前大学毕业之后就不看的读者，啊、呃，但是现在他们依然会去看科幻小说。这里面很重要的一点就是。我们引进了越来越多的国外的科幻的长篇小说，啊，同时中国的科幻作家也在写越来越多的长篇小说。这种变化的一个很重要的原因就是，呃，中国以前更多的是中短篇的小说，而现在有越来越多的图书的出版，啊，呃，所以说，呃，中国的读者，科幻读者的年龄也越来越广。呃，同时的话，女性，我们。以前都认为女性读者比较少，但是后来我们发现，呃，女性读者大概占了接近一半，这也是让我们非常出乎意料的一点。呃，整体来说的话，我们的读者还是以学生群体为主，以高中生和大学生为主。嗯、um, ，Our readers, uh, these days are more and more than years ago, and they are still they keep on increasing, which is good news for uh, science fiction literature in China. Um, mm, we have basically young readers, and they it's it's easy with them uh, to spread the voice and share the message uh, because young readers uh, usually um, share their um, uh, what, what they're currently reading with friends and with peers. So this means that the group uh, grows and increase uh, on a daily basis. And in addition to this, uh, young people, uh, we are talking about uh, from seven year old um, children to 30 years old uh, guys. And it's interesting how they growing up, 
they keep on reading, um, keeping attention, paying attention to this uh, specific genre of literature, which is science fiction, and maybe they change uh, works or, or authors, but it's still a kind of genre that involves um, involves them uh, since the very beginning. So when they start reading, when they started reading till today, uh, when they are grown up in people. Yes, uh, just one more curiosity about uh, um, the work of the editor uh, in, in between uh, writers. Uh, is it there any prevalence of gender? I mean, there is it there the same number of writers uh, between men and women, or is it there any difference? Um, 我们说, uh... Uh <笑>中国的女性的作者相对于男性作者来说是少的 呃, 还有很多的女性作家他们会站在女性的视角上去看待这个世界会给我们更多的读者因为我们的读者很多是青少年小朋友他们会带来一些不一样的视角就是以理科生我不知道你了不了解理工科理工科为主所以说这些作品的话会让中国的青少年也好中国的读者非常受欢迎像夏佳刚才提到的夏佳还有像陈定波、池慧、陈宏宇等等有非常多的这些优秀的女作家还有王侃瑜 Unfortunately, there are a few female authors, writers in science fiction, Chinese literature. Um, around 3% of the whole amount of writers are female. But what we can say about them is that their, their works are um, really interesting in, in China and their style is kind of unique. Uh, they mainly their their works are more addressed to young readers so to to children and and young students mm -hmm. but in general they are i mean they are well known and well recognized all over the world and we can mention Xia Jia uh, as um, we did before today but uh, we we hope the the number of uh, female readers not only writers can can increase and these two of course these two uh, different uh, these two references and audiences female writers and female readers are related to each other uh, thanks a lot Gordiang and uh, I would like uh, to ask to you me um, a question. Uh, as you know, today we are involved in uh, uh, in a confrontation between uh, science in reality and science in fiction. And uh, um, we know, Yuning, that you had a training as engineer. And so uh, we are first curious to know how your uh, studies um, 
conditioned your work as a science fiction uh, writer? Um, Xie Yuning, just a one T. Um, woman for um, Yu Zhou Kaji, her Yuan Yu Zhou, the Kaji, the Hunduo, Jin Tian, um, woman, um, woman, the um, Yuan Yu Zhou, the Kaji, uh, Yue Lai Yue, uh, Zhong Yao. Um, uh, Hao 我们设计的电路电路这个而且我做的电路叫阿诺格我知道阿诺格在西方的英文里面也是代表模拟代表科幻的意思其实这点很妙就是说实际上我们阿诺格是设计电路让购买我们产品的人去感知一个数字世界而我们自己是一个底层的电子工程师这样它就可以通过我们的产品去感受一个比较美好的世界这也很像我写科幻小说刚好是一个我创作然后去发现新世界的一个中介点吧这个所谓说我是一个工兵队是工兵也是一个工程师也是数字宇宙和真实宇宙的一个桥梁我的工作和我的写作大概都是这样的不知道翻译小姐能够听清楚我的意思吗 there's not a specific answer for this question because I am, it's true that I'm both. I'm a writer and I'm an engineer and it, it can be unexpected or a bit, a bit uncommon, but the two, um, these two jobs are strictly related one to, to the other because they um, both allow me uh, to uh, go deep into process, go mm. deep in studying and analyzes um, things that have been unexplored so far. Um, so uh, the, the connection between the two worlds, the engineering and the writing um, are several, but first of all, um, there's nothing more than this in the world that better um, allows you to discover, to imagine and to uh, study in things until you are able to realize them, to produce them. So it star everything starts with um, curiosity, with imagination and um, willing to explore and to know more about what we are surrounded by. And then the, the ability of uh, make put them in place and build them is something extremely scientific and technical, but still everything uh, it comes from curiosity and desire of know more, of knowledge, basically. Grazie. Eh, 
Sì, ancora, gi just one more question to you, Nate, uh, because... Uh, Hai una domanda, Xie Yuning. Um, um, he, he just spoke about his work, uh, Children in the Rival of the Universe, and, uh, uh, but we also know you name uh, for uh, one, one more recent work. I re refer to Through the Ring of Saturn, and uh, this is the probably the, 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 the most known work of uh, you name and uh, also because he won uh, two of the main uh, uh, Chinese awards. I refer to uh, Galaxy and, Neb and Nebula. You won both uh, recently, probably last year. And um, I am curious to know uh, um, the reason of uh, um, anyway, making at a first glance uh, your um, two work are very different, or they took to uh, definite, uh, or they refer, or they root, they are rooted in two uh, different um, tradition in science fiction. The first one is uh, something like a, a social and personal tradition, uh, the, and the other one, obviously. I refer to through the through the ring of Saturn uh, is about uh, uh, space uh, uh, science fiction. Um, um, why you um, two so different ways in telling science fiction? See you Ning. Uh, to the ring of Saturn. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the eager uh, children in the ripples of the universe, uh, to the ring of Saturn, um,首先我是一个科幻迷，我是一个阅读了很多科幻小说的呃作者，是我是从小阅读科幻小说，让我变成了一个科幻作者作者。其实，在我的思维里，没有一个固定的科幻类型是我必须去写的，而是我发现某一个
uh, the reason why I opted for uh, two diff so different topics, one to the other, in two different novels, is uh, first of all because uh, science fiction literature is so huge that many are the, the themes we can explore, we can go through uh, while writing about Chinese science fiction. And uh, but it's not only about the, the difference between the topics, but also in terms of style, uh, because it's mm, in, in science fiction, we don't have only uh, one um, writing scheme to, to follow, but there are many different paths we can follow. Uh, so uh, why mm, do we have to choose only one and go uh, through that only one path and not not to explore different different way of uh, writing about science fiction so that's why i wanted to uh, to spread as much as i could inside the science fiction uh, world and to me uh, the the best thing uh, I, I could do was not to choose and go uh, step by step from one uh, type of style to the other because the the willing uh, to explore um, was like a kind was it was essential in for me in writing the first one uh, deals with society, as you said, but, and with feelings of people living in that society and how um, uh, the, how life occurs. Whereas the other one um, gives us the opportunity to explore the, the space and to to experience something uh, peaceful, completely different from us. And uh, this way, uh, I got the chance to combine the traditional meaning of science, science fiction with innovation. Thanks, Yuni. Yes, it's clear. And uh, again, to come back to uh, go young uh, and uh, yes sure we, we spoke uh, uh, about um, Xia Jia and her work um, in, uh, in um, creating an interesting matching between uh, uh, digital and uh, uh, spirituality for example and uh, just a simple question uh, i am just curious to know uh, some about some other example or some other writers which they uh, take in particular um, particularly consideration uh, the digital in contemporary chinese uh, science fiction Yang Duoliang, Yang Duoliang, um, woman, in Dao, uh, you may you cheat had a sword, need a ni hungan sin chu, uh, woman shuo, quala, um, sia dia de tuo ping, cursor, uh, woman, Yang Dao, uh, you cheat had a, um, sword, uh, ni gun si huang, see.好的。呃,作為一個編輯,老編輯也是一個老的科幻迷,喜歡的作者太多了。比如说跟中国的历史结合的作品
啊，未来的元宇宙是一种更加超级的移动互联网，这是非常非常多的。呃，如果说是最喜欢的作家的话呢，呃，刘慈欣，还有呃柳文阳，柳文阳啊，是我最喜欢的两位中国的科幻作家。呃，非常荣幸的是，我们和另外一个意大利的出版商，呃，波尔索先生啊。很快就要出版一本呃关于银河奖选集的书，呃，就在十二月份会出版，呃，到时候可以关注一下，呃，那里面有很多的作品都是获得了银河奖的，也都是很年轻的作家，包括几位我很喜欢的女作家的作品。Uh, yes, of course, there are so many um interesting writers. Uh, in China, that I'm really passionate about, and many, really many of them are young people, and they are writing a lot. And I mean, there are so many um, other authors uh, besides Xia Jia that I like, that I personally like, that I cannot even count them. But uh, not only the the most recent authors are.、Um, Uh, good, good authors and well known in China.、Uh, in addition to them, of course, I I really love、uh, the the works of Liu Cixin and Liu Weiyang.、Um, they are published、um, like all over the world, and I I really wish that、um, Italian publishing house could could、um, keep on showing interest in.、Um, Chinese、uh, science fiction authors, the younger and the the well known ones.、Uh, but yes, there are many、uh, examples that I can provide with you、uh, today, because there are really, really many young writers that、um, I, I'm really interested in, in these years. We will translate more Chinese works into other languages, including English works, and maybe in the future we will have Italian works. We also hope that these very interesting writers, their works are interesting, and these people are very interesting, can be shared with you. He is really interested also in Italian authors, so he would like to know more about Italian authors. But this is like a longer conversation、uh, to to go deep in. Thanks, Gaoliang.、Uh, um, anyway, if you remain with us today, you will have、uh, the possibility to discover, for example, the work. Of Alessandro Vietti, which is an Italian writer th that today will be with us, and so、uh, could be an interesting occasion. 如果你今天呃想发现呃新意大利的作者，你可以呃听意大利呃作者的报告。呃，今天 Nexa 的会议呃有呃 Alessandro Bietti， 他呃嗯是意大利科幻的作者。所以我们都非常高兴你，呃，你想听呃他的报告，我们都喜欢，你可以喜欢他的作品。好的，谢谢，我们一定会关注，呃，也欢迎你们有时间的话呢，明年到成都来参加世界科幻大会。我的靠。Uh, he's saying that、uh, Italian writers are all welcome in Chengdu, where the publishing house has its headquarters, to to study together, to work together. Thanks a lot, Guoliang. And again, I would like uh, uh, again to you um, um, another question. I asked before to you, Ning,、uh, how his profession. Uh, conditioned his work as a、uh, uh, writer, and so、uh, I would like、uh, to take 
the problem from a, a different point of view. Uh, I'm interested, uh, or I would like to know if uh, um, science reading, science fiction uh, in, uh, in any way, in, uh, in, um, in, a, in, a, in a young age, uh, could uh, um, facilitate, um, for example, interest in the, into um, scientific and technological matters, or better, uh, if you have, have you got any example of this uh, possible uh, interaction between cultural interests and uh, then uh, um, the, the choose of the profession? Um... 我们想知道 Yin 我觉得从两个方面可以考虑哪怕是我们到宇宙有什么意见我们杂志社来或者我们到大学里面去这是一个非常好的方式 uh, This is a um, very good question and uh, thank you for asking and before while, while answering we should consider different factors that affect uh, how young people um, that affect young people life why, uh, if they approach science fiction uh, readings during their childhood and their teenage years. The first one is like reading um, is essential for young people to uh, let their curiosity grow. Giorgio, vuoi sentirmi? Perché ti abbiamo persa, per noi non riusciamo a sentirti. Magari aspettiamo un minuto. Ecco, you are come back, Giorgio. We lost you for a few seconds. Uh, I'll start again. Uh, the, the first main factor we should take into account to reply this question is reading. 
um, no matters what we are reading, but reading itself is uh, such an um, important action and habit that young people should take into consideration because it allows them to uh, develop their curiosity and let them grow with um, a wider uh, ability of imagination. So reading is uh, good for, for life, not only for looking for the, the job they, they are, um, their attitude is, uh, suits best, but also just to as approach to life. This is deter determining for, for their way of life, not only the, 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 the choose of their future job. Uh, the other reason is the activity itself, the reading as hobby, because in um, young ages, this allows people to uh, exchange opinions, having their own opinions and share them with, uh, with friends, with other peers. Um, this helps like establishing re establish relationships and create new new friendship or new point of view or again we go back to curiosity and every year uh, the publishing house it, uh, pays lots of attention to students uh, and try to get close to students because they really feel this is an um, important age range where to to intervene thank you Yumi and sorry um, and uh, I see that we have few minutes so uh, we have to uh, close our uh, our meeting but first i would like to um uh and so, bef so before to uh, to close i would like to ask uh, uh to uni uh simply uh, if he is planning uh something new or if is it there any new uh book uh, uh on in the horizon um Jieshu uh, Hui Yi Qian, woman yo uh, Tsui Ho de Wen Qi, uh, Xie Yun Ning, um, woman Ke Yi Zi Dao, yo me yo uh, Xin Pian Xiao Shuo. Uh, Li Shuo Shi, wo Zui Jin Zai Xie Le Xiao Shuo Ma? Dui, Ni, Ni, uh, Kai Shi Kan Xie, Hai Shi Xie, Xin De Xiao Shuo. 再写一个科幻小说，对他，呃，和源宇宙还有一点关系，也是，呃，人类向外太空探索，但是失败了，就是人类的未来，探索宇宙的任务交给了人工智能AI，啊，大概是一个这个故事的梗概，对，谢谢
And so uh, we would like to know if, um, can you give us uh, some impression about this event? Or whether what are you doing to for this event, very important event in the world? Uh, um, mm, woman Um uh 包括他们来之前的一些疑难问题的回答我们也是在做国内的很多的机构之间的协调工作比如说中国有很多的科幻迷科幻作家也有科幻的一些公司我们也希望做出一些让全中国这一次科幻大会不光是在成都举办它是全中国的科幻迷的一次盛会我们是希望做这么一件
谢谢，拜拜，拜拜，拜拜，再见。谁有谁有？啊，perfetto。No, sono andato solo in calcio. Eh. Bene, allora ragazzi direi che possiamo uh, continuare il nostro pomeriggio e il secondo appuntamento è sempre <coughs> dall'Asia, eh, ci spostiamo però verso Taiwan e eh, inviterei appunto Ilaria, Ilaria Peretti che è eh, curatrice insomma, della casa editrice di edizioni che ha collaborato con noi, vieni pure Ilaria, che ha collaborato con noi nella costruzione appunto del nostro convegno, ciao Ilaria, ciao. ciao. Trovata, e Ilaria eh, accoglierà il nostro secondo ospite internazionale che è eh, Città Way, eh, bene Ilaria, ti lascio la parola, grazie. Grazie a tutti, um, vogliamo aspettare un attimo che si connetta uh, a Way, prima di iniziare, così partecipa sin dall'inizio. <ride> okay. Intanto grazie a tutti e a tutti di essere qui e dell'invito anche. Um, io appunto sono editor eh, della casa editrice della collana Asia della casa editrice Ad Editore. Noi pubblichiamo eh, diversi libri dall'Asia di autori cinesi, coreani, eh, del sud-est asiatico e, e in futuro anche giapponesi. E eh, ci occupiamo anche molto di, di fantascienza, un po' l'abbiamo anche detto oggi, no? il motivo per cui. Uh, si cerca di conoscere un po' di più la fantascienza uh, che viene dall'Asia, proprio perché ci racconta uh, molto del, del mondo contemporaneo, del, uh, del presente, ci aiuta anche a avvicinarsi un po' ad un mondo che abbiamo sempre considerato uh, lontano e, e altro. Quindi ci stiamo uh, per fortuna interessando moltissimo a questo lato di mondo, anche se negli ultimi uh, decenni non, non sono stati pubblicati tantissimi. Eh, libri soprattutto dal, eh, dal cinese per varie motivazioni, ma adesso sta eh, crescendo un, un profondo interesse eh, appunto verso, verso la Cina, ma anche verso eh, Taiwan. Cercheremo oggi di eh, discutere con, con il nostro autore Cita Wei proprio di, eh, di questo, andando un po' attraverso Uh, camminando un po' attraverso la sua ultima pubblicazione, anzi l'ultima pubblicazione che abbiamo tradotto in, uh, in italiano, che abbiamo tradotto lo scorso uh, ottobre, che è questo libro, non so se viene in telecamera, Membrana, e appunto aspetterai un attimo uh, l'autore per entrare un po' più nel dettaglio dei temi e, che, che vogliamo trattare oggi. L'ultima volta ho avuto dei problemi a connettersi all'entrata.
inizio eh, introducendo l'autore mentre lo, lo aspettiamo. Um, Chikawei è una, un autore taiwanese appunto molto molto conosciuto e anche uno studioso. Lui è professore di, uh, di letteratura uh, taiwanese all'Università di, di Taipei. E eccolo qua. Hi, Taiwan. Hey, hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. How about me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Really, really. Yeah, yeah. Thank good, you. Good, good. Okay, so um, I was introducing you, so thank you for being here. It's um, it's very late in Taiwan now, it's like, <laughs> so thank you for your kind uh, thank presence you. here today. And um, so I was just uh, trying to uh, start to introduce you, and I was saying yes. that Chitawa is a is a is a renowned writer and scholar from from Taiwan. He's, is an associate professor of Taiwanese literature at the University of uh, of Taipei, and his works is uh, um, focuses on LGBTQ studies, disability studies, and uh, xenophon literature. And he is uh, best known for his book, uh, The Membranes. Uh, which was first published in 1995 in Taiwan and then published in, uh, in its Italian edition last October. And you can see the cover of the book behind, <laughs> behind Taiwan. Yeah. We show again the book. And um, so uh, this book, Membrana, is, uh, became a modern classic of queer speculative fiction and in Chinese, and uh, after 30 years from its, its uh, publication, it hasn't lost an ounce of its provo provocative significance. And I will just briefly go through the plot of the book so we can start with the question. And the book is, is set in the late 21st century, and Momo, which is uh, the protagonist of the book, is uh, the most celebrated dermal care technician uh, of the city of, uh, of T. And in this world that Tawei has imagined, um, the humanity has migrated at the bottom of the sea uh, because of the, uh, the, they wanted to escape from the devastating climate change. And as a burning sun on the surface was uh, destroying the earth and ju had just left dryness and, and destruction. And um, so the world is dominated by powerful media conglomerates and runs on exploited cyber labor. And I will just start from here, from the context. Uh, and you wrote this book in the 90s and in a period in which Taiwan was changing a lot and Taiwan had left behind 30 years of martial law. And so in, in, in the 90s started to open itself uh, to cultural influence, influences and to influences from the outside world. But it was also a period uh, of where the prevailing capitalism in, in general, in, in the global world was looking to a fast uh, and hyper-connected future and based primarily on, on technologies and digital technologies. So the, the question, my first question is this one, how did you, uh, did everything of this, so the context of, of Taiwan and the global context uh, influence, uh, influence your work, your book, and how did you concretize all this in your story? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh... Uh, first of all, I of course I have to thank uh, Ilaria and I. I miss uh, my wonderful time with uh, the uh, with the uh, many booksellers and publishers and the editors in Italy. And I also thank uh, uh, Nexa Center for the Great Opportunity for for me to participate. And uh, uh, Ilaria, thank you for reminding me of the uh, my my experience of writing the membranes. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it's true that uh, um, by the end of the pre okay, previous century, the combination of the human and the machine 
was already a very uh, popular topic among people. For instance, you maybe you know that the uh, um, the cell phones, the very primitive model of cell phones, were already emerging. Only only very rich people could afford the cell phones in the nineties. But uh, we could for we could predict that the uh, cell phones would be become much cheaper and uh, much more uh, widely available and uh, attached to everybody in the future. We already uh, predict that in the, in the 90s. And uh, uh, we also, in Taiwan, we, we also, I mean, especially the students and the teachers started to use the internet in the 90s. So uh, when we spend so much time on the internet, sometimes more time in, in online than offline, it was difficult for us to tell what was real, what was life, because actually we spent a lot of life online. And, uh, but the, we, do, we couldn't see that, okay, everything would be much more serious in the 21st century. So when I, um, when I uh, started to write the membranes, I was actually collecting many signals which were already available in the 90s. For instance, uh, I could already foresee that uh, cell phones would be very popular. Uh, I, I could foresee that uh, the internet would take more time from us. And uh, uh, I also uh, knew that uh, the climate change would be much worse in the future, but uh, I didn't know that uh, uh, Italy would become so hot now, of course, it's certainly very uh, surprising. It's more than uh, what I could imagine. So um, I think that I was lucky that uh, um, I was inspired when uh, 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 many Taiwanese people, including me, were open to many um, inspirations all over the world by the end of the previous century. OK. Thank you. Yes, it, Thank was, you. it was really hot when you came in Italy. It was really crazy. And yeah. um, so before I said that your book, The Membrane, is uh, a modern classic of queer speculative fiction. And I wanted to go through uh, this. So in science fiction, I would say that heteronormativity and masculine chauvinism is quite common and in a very straight uh, perspective and um, when actually I think that cyberpunk, the cyberpunk world which is so linked to the, the idea of transformation no? could uh, uh, give us, provide us uh, a, a, a more open uh, perspective about certain things. But the membranes uh, so your work seems to be a little bit timeless. So uh, it seems that you escape a little bit from this uh, binary vision mm. of the world. And so I, I wanted to ask you, um, how did you relate it with uh, gender fluidity and social construction of identity? And mm. how can the identity construction be reimagined or maybe also changed uh, following like your science fiction scenario. So we are talking about robotic and um, uh, bodies, androids, and artificial intelligence, and etc. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, it's true that uh, um, in the 90s, uh, um, people, including me, were very excited with but also frightened by all the uncertainties all over the world. Uh, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we were happy that uh, uh, Taiwan suddenly became much more democratic in the 90s, but uh, we were not sure what would happen. And uh, at the same time, maybe, yeah, everybody know, remember that uh, yeah, China was quickly changing uh, um, in the 90s and uh, uh, we also know that uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed in the 90s and the Berlin, Berlin War uh, um, was, was done in the 90s. So uh, there were a lot of opportunities, but uh, 
but the but the uh, we were uh, we we uh, try to survive the uncertainties, and uh, we were trying to know who we were. So you in um in the nineties, many people in Taiwan suddenly uh, realized that uh, maybe we are Taiwanese but not the Chinese. Maybe we our homeland is right here, Taiwan, but not somewhere in Beijing or in Shanghai. But uh, in the past, um, many people simply, in the past, people simply say that, okay, Taiwan uh, was a, a, a Chinese land. But uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, people didn't take it for granted anymore. And I think that is a, a, applicable to many other realms as well, for instance, in terms of agenda, in terms of sexual orientation. That's why, and that's why uh, readers today might find that the, in membranes, there are so many uncertainties. Okay, so we don't know that if the, uh, the character is Asian or not, if the city uh, in the novel uh, belong to Taiwan or not, if the character is male or female, is the character a human or a, a a machine because uh, uh, the readers might find that the uh, the uh, the novel is very mysterious because there are so many uncertainties. But the uh, I think that the, the novel uh, is also uh, so true to uh, the decade of its production in the nineties because in the nineties we didn't know what we were. We were trying to figure out what we were as well. So I think that uh, is really the is really a production of its time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and following this this reflection, why did you decide? As today we are talking about science fiction, and why did you decide to use science fiction to speak about uh, these things, uh, and not okay, like I, a, writing a, another kind of novel or an autobiography? Okay, I think that uh, I I in, in, in fact to admit admit that uh, uh, I I think that in in the nineties a uh, a key word was freedom and then so many people wanted freedom political freedom sexual freedom and the freedom for artistic production and so on and I also wanted freedom on my own and uh, I honestly I was. Uh, inspired by a lot of Italian masters in films, in literature. Many, maybe some, some of you know that uh, uh, when I was in high school, even when I was in sex high school, I was already a fan of uh, Pierpaolo Pasolini and because I thought that he was very brave. He made so many, so many shocking films and uh, so that I was encouraged that, okay, I, I hope that I could do something, whatever I wanted to do in the future when I grew up, because I want to be similarly brave. And uh, I, uh, I adopted the science fiction, uh, not because of um, Pasolini, but because of uh, Italo Calvino, partly because of Italo Calvino. Uh, because I, uh, I remember in the 90s, uh, actually Italo Calvino's show stories, uh, many of which are science fiction stories, were once very popular in Taiwan and in China. And uh, they were so playful and they, for instance, uh, so sometimes in, in them, the, uh, I, of course, you all of you know Italo Cavino much more than I do. So I was just simply say that uh, I, uh, I, I found that uh, uh, science, fiction, science fiction could be also very playful, uh, very uh, um, very experimental, and uh, uh, it didn't need to be uh, as heavy as the uh, science fiction in Anglo American tradition. That's why that's why I try to uh, write uh, adopt the form of science fiction, and uh, uh, and of course I I have admit that. Uh, uh, I was also influenced by a lot of uh, Japanese animation and the manga comics. And I know that, uh, uh, of course, uh, nowadays, uh, 
Japanese um, manga and animation are also uh, very popular in, in Italy, but uh, I grew up reading them. And uh, uh, maybe you know that uh, science fiction uh, has been very common in Japanese culture. So it's natural for me to adopt the form of science fiction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's nice that you talked about Vito Lucanzino because we talked about him this morning. So it's really, really nice to listen to you now. And so as, as this panel is about so existence and uh, the identity and machine also, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, in your book, you explore the, the contact zone between human and non-human consciousness, but also uh, corporality. So we said before that the body is, is clearly important for you. Momo is a dermal care technician. She massages bodies. So you represent a body uh, that is increasingly transforming, right? So uh, her friends are androids, the animals are robots. And so you show this hyper technological uh, and hyper connected world. And I wanted to, to ask you, to your point of view, uh, to what extent these imaginaries found a place in the contemporary world? Because you, you wrote this book in the 90s, but a lot of, of things have changed. So they found that like a safe place in the contemporary world. And how do you imagine like another future? Mm -hmm. Uh, in in fact, that uh, um, I I have to say that uh, um, uh, the older I become, I the uh, the less trust I have in machines. And in the I when I was younger, I was uh, uh, I enjoyed to be. Uh, connected to uh, different platforms online to different machines, but now, but uh, but now I really, uh, I often want to put away my my cell phones, my computers, put away, and I want to just take uh, uh, go hiking uh, alone in the mountains, uh, uh, in the forest, and I think that uh, is a, because I think uh, maybe it's a way uh, to resist in the the overwhelming uh, presence of the machines and uh, and i can i think that uh, perhaps we have to prepare that in the future uh, many of us will be even more carried away blown away by by the presence of machines in fact uh, i am a, as you know that i'm a college teacher in uh, in taipei and uh, i often uh, jokingly talk to my students that uh, in, I encourage students to to go dating, to dating uh, among fellow students or outside the college anyway. You date people of your gender or different gender or whatever gender anyway, date somebody real. Because you don't know in a few, maybe in 10 after 10 years, you have no real people to date. You have to date machines in the future. That's very probable. And we know that uh, perhaps that would be very nice because uh, robbers might not fight with you. Robbers would then would be, perhaps they would be very obedient to you. They would then uh, argue for divorce, perhaps. Who knows? But, um, but uh, I find, uh, but I, I think that uh, uh, whatever, maybe, maybe the future would be nice, but uh, the human world, what we are having now, might be disappearing. What we are having now might be very different in the future. And uh, we know that, uh, for instance, that yeah, we are we are losing our uh, our summer become longer and longer. Our winter becomes so short. Uh, we are losing so many lands under the sea. I mean, in real life, and uh, we are uh, uh, giving so much time away to the machines. So why not? It is very possible that uh, we are going to give away our intimacy to non-human existence. That's very possible. And uh, I, I don't know if it would be a good idea. So 
yeah, well, I will tell my friend, I tell my students, yeah, try to date real humans. And I and I talk to my colleagues, people of my age that I try to go hiking without your phone because you don't know if the mountain behind uh, in front of you will be still there after 10 years. Who knows? Thank you. Um, I will just uh, probably make a, maybe one last question and then ask for a question from the public. And before you connected, I was saying that um, is in, in the recent decades, translation of science fiction in Chinese represented like a, a rare but very welcome uh, exception in an editorial panorama which is dominated by Anglo-American uh, writer. And but in recent years, anyway, we we are witnessing uh, um, an interest uh, in uh, Chinese uh, literature, Taiwanese literature, uh, due probably to the fact that uh, this part of the world is um, uh, increasingly increasingly their power all over the world worldwide. So we are like more attentive to this kind of work. And as a liter literature professor, Taiwan's literature professor, I wanted to ask you, uh, which is the, um, if there are young authors of science fiction in Taiwan, uh, if there are authors that like you are using science fiction to speak about queerness and gender, and uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I think that, uh... Uh, um, me, we, we, we have to uh, admit that uh, uh, nowadays uh, uh, global readers pay so much attention to science fiction from China because uh, China becomes a superpower in outer space in, uh, in terms of military force and so on. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, President uh, Barack Obama of the United States uh, himself recommended uh, science fiction from China to American readers. I think, yeah, uh, partly because that uh, uh, the science fiction from China becomes so good, and uh, partly because uh, uh, Americans and the uh, global readers want to know what's going on in terms of science and the technology in East Asia. So uh, uh, I think that uh, that's that's. Uh, we do feel that, and I think that uh, there, uh, uh, there is some ripple effect uh, outside China as well. For instance, we we can sense that we, in fact, uh, science fiction from Korea is also emerging, and uh, we know that the Korean people also make science fiction movies. And uh, in Taiwan, I think that um, um, it's true that uh, many writers. Uh, of my age, over over uh, who are younger than I am, are trying to write science fiction as well because many believe that uh, if uh, people still read literature in the future, maybe they will only read science fiction. <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, people kind of worried because who knows? Because uh, if science fiction is about the future, people of the future might might be closer to science fiction and uh, uh, and i also i also believe that uh, uh, when writers are writing science fiction they really have to uh, think about the 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 um, the general fate of humankind as a whole because uh, when we write science fiction we cannot really isolate and the, uh, one character and only focus on the character's love, affair, and so on, private life. We need to consider so many different factors like uh, the social uh, the social change, the uh, what's going on, uh, in uh, what happened to the natural environment, uh, what happened to the uh, uh, technology and the uh, economic foundation. And, and I think that is a huge challenge. Uh, so science fiction might not be easy to handle, but uh, uh, it's true that many uh, local writers in Taiwan are trying it as well now. 
Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Maybe I, I will ask to the public if there is any question, any interest about Sawai's work. One question. What's he working on now? Right. I, I was asking the same question. <laughs> Uh, somebody said um, a question. Uh, so, are you working on something now? Something new? Yeah, thank you. It's very, it's a, a very flattering for you to ask that. Uh, in fact, uh, you maybe may, many of you know that uh, uh, the membranes was published a very long time ago. Um, uh, when I was a college student, but uh, now I am already a college teacher, and I admit that. Uh, I am really consider uh, writing new science fiction because I find uh, uh, science fiction might mean much more than academic papers. <laughs> so um, if uh, in uh, I am considering uh, writing a sequel to the membranes and the, in the uh, new novel, I want to talk about some topics that I, I didn't fully develop in the membranes, uh, such as immigration, uh, because uh, in the membranes, uh, when people reloc relocate from the lands to the bottom of the sea, of course, is immigration. And I also want to talk about, to write about the refugees, because yeah, now, nowadays we know refugees are really everywhere and in every from every continent. And uh, so many countries are suffering from the refugee crisis. But uh, I didn't really talk about refugees in the membranes, although they are refugees in the membranes. And uh, also I want to talk about colonization because um, uh, we know that the uh, imperialism in different forms are certainly over around us. Of course, we know that uh, for instance, uh, uh, there is a, a lot of imperialism on social media. Yeah, we, we just, we, we know it. And I think that uh, uh, this power relation uh, should be uh, fully de uh, developed in my new novel. Uh, but uh, in addition, I also want to, uh, as I said earlier, I encourage my students to date human beings. So I will also uh, try to depict characters who are dating actual human beings in the new novel. So maybe that would be fun. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that we finished our time for 30 minutes. So I just wanted to thank you a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Credo che adesso ci sia una pausa. 30 minuti di pausa. Ok, 30 minuti. Pausa.
Allora, eh, intanto grazie per l'invito a questa conferenza, grazie a Nexa, grazie a Mufa e grazie a voi che siete qui presenti. Io sono Giorgio Raffelli, sono un editore con eh, il mio socio Marco Scarabelli, abbiamo fondato il progetto Zona 42 ormai otto, più di otto anni fa, non sono tantissimi, ma comunque un po' di libri ne abbiamo fatti e ci occupiamo principalmente di fantascienza, fantascienza e altre meraviglie. E siamo qui per fare una chiacchierata con Trotto Samasse, Martin Felipe Castagné e Alessandro Vietti, che guarda caso sono tutti autori della nostra casa editrice, che vengono da tre posti molto lontani tra di loro, ma che sono accomunati da una grande eh, capacità immaginifica, sono degli ottimi autori e scrivono dei gran bei libri. Io avrei voluto esporli qua a farli vedere, ma non c'è un supporto di qui, poi magari vi faccio vedere singolarmente. Ma la cosa più importante è quello che avranno da dire eh, loro. Faccio un giro giusto per presentarveli. Allora, Trotto Samas è un'autrice del Botswana, eh, scrive in inglese, ha pubblicato una serie di racconti sulle più importanti riviste eh, genere, di genere americane. Poi Giorgio, abbiamo... scusami, mi permetto di interromperti per tradurre la, esatto, la prima sì. parte. Grazie. Uh, hello and welcome everyone and thank you for having me here. Thank you Mufant and thank you Nexa for uh, putting in place this amazing uh, conference and this moment to uh, gather in together. Uh, let me introduce myself first before uh, having like presenting uh, the rest of the host of the day. I am Giorgio Raffaelli and I'm uh, working at the publishing house uh, Zona 42, Zone 42, uh, since eight years. Um, uh, together with my colleague, we tried to um, create um, an amazing uh, publishing house uh, based on mainly on science fiction's um, uh, works and we are now working on wonderful projects we can't wait to to talk about it today uh, thanks to the um the intervention of uh, some of the authors uh, we uh, as publishing house uh, publish Mm, here we have amazing authors, and before we listen to their stories, uh, let me introduce them one at a time. Eh, scusami, non sono abituato a essere tradotto io. Eh, adesso vado, vado con calma. Eh, allora, partiamo da Trot Samasse, che diceva un'autrice del Botswana, scrive in inglese. Ha iniziato pubblicando eh, racconti sulle più importanti riviste dedicate al genere negli Stati Uniti, poi capiremo come ci è arrivata. E un paio di anni fa ha pubblicato una novella intitolata, eh, noi l'abbiamo tradotta come Silenziosa sfiorisce la pelle, e che ha avuto un ottimo riscontro di pubblico e di critica e pochi mesi fa abbiamo pubblicato, perché siamo stati molto felici di lavorare con lei, anche un paio di suoi racconti in edizione particolare, un flipbook, un, flip un racconto di fantascienza Trinport e uno che va più verso il territorio del realismo magico che si indicava il distretto della Cervicia. Uh, here we have um, Toslo Tsamase, welcome. Uh, she's a novelist from Botswana. She writes in English and uh, we start publishing, no, she started publishing uh, on magazine in, in the US uh, about science fiction, of course. And we now published um, a novel uh, titled uh, in Italian, Silenziosa sfiorisce la pelle. And we also published um, sci a science fiction novel um, that lead toward uh, magic realism. Okay. Poi eh, con noi c'è Martin Felipe Castagné, lui invece è sta a Buenos Aires in Argentina, eh, ha pubblicato un paio di romanzi, noi ne abbiamo tradotto uno recentemente, eh, si intitola I corpi dell'estate, lo squarpo del veragno in, uh, in spagnolo. Ah, okay. <ride> e, mh, stavo dicendo, vi scrive dall'Argentina, ha pubblicato un paio di romanzi, noi abbiamo, lo abbiamo conosciuto ed è interessante questa cosa grazie al lavoro della traduttrice eh, Francesca Signorello che ci ha proposto in lettura il romanzo, 
ci ha conquistati perché noi fino a questo momento abbiamo sempre solo tradotto dall'inglese oppure pubblicato testi italiani. Eh, abbiamo conosciuto Martin grazie a Francesco Signorello e siamo rimasti affascinati dal suo testo e questo è il motivo per cui è arrivato in zona. Uh, the other host of the day is uh, from Argentina. He is Martin Felipe Castanier. Welcome, Martin. Um, he published a couple of novels and we as a publishing house recently published uh, I Corpi dell'estate, the book they both showed. Um, and it's interesting how we discovered his works because uh, it was thanks to the translator, the Italian translator uh, Francesca Signorello, who uh, found out this, um, this amazing work and she um, She, she shared uh, her translation with us and we decided to, to publish as a publishing house in Italy. Poi con noi abbiamo Alessandro Vietti che è qui a Torino, eh, lui è di Genova, con lui ormai abbiamo una pubblicazione pluriannuale, lui ha iniziato pubblicando Fantascienza negli anni 90 con l'editrice Nord, eh, che se c'è qualcuno che frequenta la Fantascienza lo conosce bene come marchio, poi negli ultimi otto anni, ha pubblicato due romanzi con noi, Real Mars e Il Potere, e sta lavorando a un terzo romanzo, sempre per Tone 42, e poi magari che è forse più legato al tema di questa conferenza. E, ok, direi che come presentazione succinta va bene. And last but not least, we have Alessandro Ietti from uh, Genova here in Turin today. He published his first uh, works uh, uh, as um, science fiction novels of, of the 90s. And the last eight years, he published with us a real Mars novel and uh, the, Il, Il Potere, The Power. Uh, and he's now working on the third novel, which is um, one of the most interesting topic uh, among his works uh, based on the, the topic of the conference of today. Uh, so it's the, the most connected to the digital the, and the digitalization uh, as a topic. Okay. A questo punto io lascio la parola ai nostri autori. Eh, la prima domanda era... Eh, perché hanno deciso di scrivere fantascienza? Nel senso che sappiamo bene che con la fantascienza non è un problema solo italiano, non è che eh, si diventa ricchi, però è una scelta, secondo me, di campo sia artistico che eh, politico in qualche modo, e anche perché credo, ma questo lo lasciamo vedere se questa idea è condivisa, per le, la libertà che offre e la possibilità di speculare sul mondo contemporaneo. Per cui la domanda è come sono arrivati alla, alla scrittura e come mai hanno scelto la letteratura di genere come approdo? Uh, before... Partirei da Trotlo, eh, Famasse, Martin Felipe Castagnier e Alessandro Vitti in fila. Before leaving the, the words to our authors, respectively, uh, starting with Totlo, uh, Martin, and then Alessandro, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our main questions for this meeting of today. Uh, the question is, Uh, we all know that um, writing about science fiction uh, doesn't um, make us richer or the most popular in the world, but uh, the, the main point is how to make this choice. What uh, leads you to start writing about science fiction, about fiction in general? Uh, is it something about politics? Is it about freedom? It's something, is it something that makes you feel uh, free to express yourself in these current years, uh, to use the um, current hot topics and re-elaborate them through writings? And how did you approach the genre? Thank you. Lotto, if you want to start. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, and that's a very great question. Um, it's a combination of all those. Um, when I started out writing, I didn't, I did not necessarily pick the genre. I just found myself in this genre because of the concepts I was coming up with. I was also drawn to this genre because 
I'm a film fanatic. I watched a lot of science fiction film and horror. And the novelist that I was attracted to also wrote in that genre. Um, additional to that, I had uh, studied architecture in undergrad. And um, I found that program very fas fascinating and surreal um, in the sense that design itself was a foreign language. Um, and I was very fascinated by the whole process that goes into designing buildings which are habitable for people. Um, studying the environment, studying the, the material, knowing the physics. And I remember one time having an idea, what if you could design human beings like this? And I had to go about um, analyzing what would um, be involved in that process. But on top of that, I also had to be aware um, of the economic pressures that people go through, what it means to be marginalized. So I found myself over time dealing with these political situations or the issues that people deal with all over the world. There were things that I couldn't keep quiet about. And for me, writing eventually became very cathartic. It allowed um, it allowed um me to write about these voices that are normally not heard and that became very important to me um yes i'll stop there procedo con la traduzione non credo che ci sia bisogno perfetto no martin we can hear you Yes, uh, it's <laughs> it's the the sickness of our age, no, being mute <laughs> by mistake. <laughs> okay, uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very very happy to to be here. Uh, well, here <laughs> to be in this digital place, um, and uh, I think uh, too that this is a thought question uh, because it is impossible to really know what attract us from a specific genre but uh, I think that uh, my childhood uh, is, is, is crucial because uh, in my family home uh, my parents uh, have um, uh, um, uh, an incredible uh, collection of books uh, and a lot were uh, of science fiction and fantasy um, and afterwards when I was in high school uh, one of uh, my teachers of literature teachers uh, gave us to read uh, Fahrenheit um, 451 and for me the, the was there was something like an an epiphany uh, reading that book uh, because uh, this is what i want to do uh, i want to 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 be uh, that kind of 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 brave uh, because I, I i i truly believe that bradbury was a, a brave guy uh, who who tried all the time you know, to think outside the, the box you know, of his age and customs and, and place. Uh, and science fiction always tries to cre not, not, not create, to discover an, another, you know, the, the other one. The other one could be uh, another race, you know, uh, being a, an alien uh, creature, you know, from outer space. Uh, but it is always inside of us. Uh, so for me, uh, the, the 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 creative freedom that uh, science fiction uh, uh, includes. Uh, it is always a, a, fr a freedom to to think out, outside 
the the very things that they teach us from 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 our very childhood. Okay, thank you, Martin, Alessandro. Ma eh, io personalmente faccio fatica a rispondere a questa domanda perché, mh, al contrario di come diceva Martin, non ho avuto nessuna epifania. Eh, è stato un percorso, è stato un, un processo di, di, di scoperta. Inizi, eh, come dire, la fantascienza innanzitutto ha scelto me eh, perché eh, classe 69 vai a guardare Guerre Stellari al cinema a otto anni e qualcosa, nonostante sia Guerre Stellari, ti lascia dentro. Eh, la fantascienza l'ho avuta sempre dentro, ho iniziato a leggere e come spesso capita vuoi imitare. Ed è così che inizi, inizi tipicamente per imitazione, per vedere se sei capace di farlo, no? ti metti alla prova e poi scopri piano piano, un po' ti illudi magari di essere capace, perché poi insomma, sono gli altri che ti dicono se sei capace o no, e, e scopri soprattutto che ti piace farlo. E scopri piano piano quali sono le potenzialità che quel, quella capacità espressiva ha, perché quando inizi che magari sei stai finendo l'adolescenza, comunque sei all'inizio degli anni, dei vent'anni, eccetera, non hai ancora la maturità personale, a mio avviso, eh, e culturale per poter pensare a tutte le cose che potrai fare poi se andrai avanti eh, con, eh, con questo genere. E quindi io ho in qualche modo fatto questo percorso lentamente finché a un certo punto ho avuto la fortuna di vincere un concorso sono stato pubblicato dalla casa di Cenoto, come diceva Giorgio, e se forse quello forse non fosse successo, forse non sarei qui oggi. Quindi un po' di coincidenze, un po' di voglia di provarci, tante cose insieme. Ok. In my case, uh, it was a bit different from what Martin just said, because there was no epiphany. Uh, it was it deals with a process of slow discovery of uh, what I mm, of what I love. And I loved it since uh, I was an early teenager, as uh, most of my peers born in uh, 19 in 1969, uh, one of the best thing that I've had was uh, Star Wars, seeing, watching Star Wars at the cinema when I was eight years old. Uh, and then I started reading uh, about that genre and then again writing, uh, since I realized that writing was my, not only um, something I really liked and loved doing, but uh, it was also a personal challenge. So I realized that uh, I, I really enjoyed writing and step by step, when you are a 20 year old guy and you don't really know what you're going to do in the future on what's, what, what will be your job or um, your, your desire, you start thinking of writing seriously and then more and more seriously. Uh, and then I was uh, so, I mean, I was lucky to win uh, an award And so here I am, uh, having won an award and a bit of luck and a bit of struggle and talent, and this is what I'm now. La, seguendo questo discorso sulle regioni diverse, i vari spazi del mondo da dove arrivano i nostri autori, eh, noi consideriamo spesso come la fantascienza sia un genere eminentemente anglosassone, americano, poi inglese. Eh, mentre i nostri autori vengono appunto dalla periferia della sfera di influenza, non si può dire dell'impero americano, uh -huh. okay, dalla sfera di influenza eh, anglosassone. Eh, chi magari come Flotro da un paese eh, dove non c'è una, una traduzione letteraria di genere, eh, Flotro Samas è probabilmente la prima autrice di fantascienza fantastico del Botswana. Altri come eh, Martin Felipe Castagné, che invece dall'Argentina si porta dietro una tradizione eh, che è basata molto più sul fantastico che non sulla fantascienza, basta pensare a autori come Borges, facciamo solo un nome ed è sufficiente. 
E Alessandro invece è la situazione italiana, magari la conosciamo meglio perché ci siamo dentro anche noi, però sappiamo quanto sia sempre stata eh, bistrattata la fantascienza scritta dagli autori italiani, eh, che è sempre stata considerata secondaria o comunque derivativa rispetto a quella americana. Eh, da queste origini molto diverse sono arrivati dei risultati molto personali, perché sia i romanzi e i racconti di Zamas che i romanzi di Castagné o quelli di, di, di Vietti hanno davvero una nota, per, non hanno nulla di derivativo dal mio punto di vista, sono tutti basati su un immaginario molto personale e una resa di questo immaginario sulla carta che è eh, unica, che denota proprio la capacità autoriale. Però come si arriva da, dai margini della sfera anglofona a, a, essere, a crearsi una propria personalità letteraria nel genere? We can see here different backgrounds and different languages and different nationalities too. Uh, so science fiction mm, now means that it doesn't only comes from it doesn't only come from the US uh, as we as most of the people think nowadays. Uh, yes, of course, uh, it can be mm, spread by American writers in, and they for sure encouraged other mm, national, uh, other countries to go deep in this genre. But uh, we have here a great example of uh, an English native speaker and writer uh, who come from who comes from Botswana, uh, who has no um, deep tradition of science fiction and fiction in their own country but then he he she she was um, anyway able to discover uh, the genre um, in her country or while, while growing up and uh, the same for argentina uh, the, in there there's a deep tradition of fantasy rather than science fiction we can say uh, just to mention one of the the biggest uh, borges uh, and and then we have italy uh, where we we can say that mm, the genre is not considered as um, as in the us it's not considered essential as in 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 the us but from here we can see also examples of um really personal works um works where the authors put themselves in there and they create something unique in their own through their own imaginary so mm, not only uh, mm, basing their writing in um in the imaginary in the common imaginary uh, from the US. So the question is how to get this, how to, to get this result in different countries, different from the US? Starting from Clotlo and then uh, Martin and then Alessandro. Um, so I hope I got the question correctly. Basically, how to um, access the U.S. Uh, publishing market with telling um, science fiction stories from different cultures, correct? Uh, it's more about the different culture in which you uh, grew up and, uh, and then uh, how to put your background, your cultural background in uh, your stories. How you um, were able to, to discover the genre and to develop your own genre despite the lack of uh, fiction mm, tradition okay. in your country. Okay, um, so I'll just give a quick background. Um, when I started writing um, to complete a full novel was probably uh, seven, was probably 11 years ago. And um, at that time, there was no existing publishing industry in Botswana. Um, there was also no science fiction scene. Um, I was completely isolated and felt very lonely. Um, I did try to look for options in the country, but it was very impossible. Um, so I did one thing, which was Google, how to be an author, how to get published. Um, and at that time, I was writing a lot of novels. Um, and I wanted 
to read also novels that had representation of Africans in a science fiction world. And I had to scavenge through the internet to find if there were any authors who were writing about us. Um, I remember at that time, I think I was an undergrad student at the University of Botswana. I came across Lauren Bucher's book, which is Maxiland and Zoo City. And these were based in um, South Africa, which is a neighboring country to Botswana. And I remember I fell in love with those works and the way that she just represented the couch in South Africa and the city in South Africa and also the politics. I was like, wow, someone is doing this. I could possibly even try and do this so eventually I started scavenging for more works and I started working on my writing um so when I did try to um, get published in the U.S. Uh, I was trying to get a literary agent which is sort of the gatekeeper middle uh, middleman to getting a book deal from a publisher um and that was tough I think took maybe five to seven years I cannot recall I'm trying to get an agent writing novels and I think maybe at that time it was because um, I was writing about my culture um, about identity which was very important um, and having those features in the novels is probably what added to the rejections that I was getting so it was a very it was a very traumatizing process um, so after that struggle, I took a year off writing because um, I just couldn't do it anymore, just backbreaking. And eventually I said, okay, let me try short stories. You know, they are quicker to write um, as opposed to novels, which take a lot of time. And I could probably become a better writer. And some other authors have broken into the industry this way. So I started working on a lot of um, short stories um, whilst I was also studying a lot of novels that were within the international um, market. Um, examples I could give Helen Oyeyemi's um, books, um, Haruki Murakami, and other many authors. So by studying this, I was able to study the narratives which were accepted, um, the plot structures, and in a way, I was able to blend um, my studying of this with also the way that I was telling stories from my culture. And um, my short stories eventually got published by several US magazines um, like Clark's World, Apex Magazine. And then eventually, um, because I wanted to tell a story that had a bit of our folklore and myth, um, that's how I ended up writing The Silence of the Warting Skin. And when I came to writing The Silence of the Warting Skin, every single thing I studied, I broke those rules and created um, this novella, which um, was eventually published by a small press in the US, Pink Narcissus Press, and eventually um, translated by Zona 42, um, Georgie Rafaeli, and here we are now. Um, yeah, this has been going on for a long time, so let me stop here. Thank you. Well, uh, in my case, uh, the, the origins of science fiction in Argentina uh, are very linked to my origins as a science fiction writer uh, because there was a publishing house that was very, very important in the in the way science fiction was translated not only into Spanish but into our own tradition. Uh, when I said before that uh, in my family home there was a lot of science fiction and fantasy books, they were all from the same publishing house, Minotauro, like the, the Mino, 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 Minotaur, no? Yes. Um, and it was a creation of uh, Francisco Paco Porrua. Porrua uh, was the... the the Spanish born but Argentine uh, raised um, uh, publisher who was also the publisher of 100 Years of Solitude and Hopscotch, no, and another, uh, and a lot of <laughs> uh, central 
uh, novels of the last century, specifically from real, magic realism. Uh, but before all of that, before he published all these books uh, as, as, a, as a publisher, uh, he had this very, very small uh, wow. independent publishing house, Minotauro, uh, and he used uh, to uh, publish, but but also translate himself uh, all these uh, artworks uh, as uh, the Martian Chronicles of Ray Bradbury and Fahrenheit, of course, uh, but also uh, afterwards uh, the Lord of the Rings. The left, the left hand of darkness uh, and the dispossessed, uh, the the man in the high castle, uh, Vonnegut, no. So, and when he did that, the 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 very first book uh, he published, uh, the Martian, the Martian Chronicles, uh, he put a, a a legend that said, "Ciencia ficción." There wasn't at the time, a translation of, of the term into Spanish. There was a, a lot of terms, but he chose that one, Ciencia Ficción. Uh, so he created a, a publishing house, especially to translate uh, this genre to the Spanish language for the first time. You know, even in, in, in Spain, for the first time in our language. But, and this is the, the, the main point of what I'm trying to say, a few years later, when he discovered that he wanted to publish uh, other books that were in the genre, but in the, in the, in the borders, no? in, the, in, the, uh, in the mix zone between the fantasy and science fiction and horror and something else, for example, uh, the Invisible Cities of Italo Calvino or Lord of the Flies of William Golding, no? that th there is nothing supernatural, perhaps. Um, he put away that legend of science fiction and he uh, tried all his life no? to mix all this genre. And that was also the the main thinking of Borges, Bioy Casares, Silvino Campo. Uh, so in my country, in Argentina, in a opposite way of the United States, no, the, the, the main country where all these works proceed uh, in general, um, it, it's the opposite because we don't want this hard borders exactly we want to mix we want to we want an, an hybrid in, in fact in some cases we want the deceive no being deceived no about what we are reading no expecting something and then later finding that we are reading another kind of book so um i am a writer who writes this way, because that is my tradition. And my tradition is a tradition of impurity, and very proudly. I love Argentina way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I try to speak a bit darkly in English to, to, to make the process of, of, of the conference easier. Uh, we have tradition in Italy uh, of fantastic. Uh, well, today, probably the most uh, uh, quoted uh, author, it Italian author was Calvino. Uh, and of course, uh, if, we, if we say, if we talk about uh, Cosmic Comica, uh, is, is, a, is a very international, are very international tapes, are not Italian tapes. Uh, because I, I think that fantastic is is not always uh, is is a, a, a general genre. 
is is not uh, is, is, is because the the fabula uh, because uh, uh, it enters in in the in the in the in the way of life in the in the in the view of of the system of the people of the fears on the on the loves of of, of this all these topics that are general and 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 the fantastic is is uh, often not always of course all, often is 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 is, is uh, over national uh, and and uh, but in, in italy uh, the, the science fiction specific science science fiction uh, tradition uh, is uh, uh, like george said for uh, is not so fine for the others uh, until the end of 90s i think uh, because on uh, the new century there was uh, uh, a, a new, a new uh, perception coming uh, in, in Italy about uh, uh, national authors, and uh, uh, of course uh, uh, the authors. They are the authors, but of, of course that you need also the readers. Uh, and if you don't have the readers, uh, uh, you don't have also the authors, and you have to uh, uh, make the readers. Uh, 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 want uh, to uh, read the Italian authors and uh, uh, make them uh, uh, loving Italian authors, and uh, you have to uh, um, prove to the readers that you are capable to do something, something new, something interesting, and uh, but not not specifically on 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 your nation, of course, but uh, you you can you can go wider. Uh, for, for the reason I told before. Uh, for example, in, in my novels, uh, I have novel with like the Impotere, the power, that is specifically Italian. Is a, is a, is a novel, a very, very specific, uh, set in Italy with the Italian uh, uh, topics, uh, fascism and so on. But also, Real Mars uh, is not Italian, is, is, a, is, like an, is a totally another kind of setting, uh, as it is a more European, or, or worldwide, uh, if we want to do this. And uh, so uh, it depends on uh, how, or what you want to, to write, what you want to tell, and how, uh, how you want to tell. And, and, and this can, can change from book to, to other book. And, and, uh, and this, is the, this is what I, I love about the science fiction. And, and in Italy, uh, we we hope also uh, Zona 42 make this great job to uh, to make this uh, spreading uh, the the science fiction in uh, and uh, in, in Italy to to demonstrating that that we as Italian authors uh, are able to do good science fiction and interesting and with the modern uh, modern writing, modern topics, and and, and not uh, make an imitation of something else. Sì, giustissimo. Infatti, lo, lo scopo, quello, quello che mi piaceva di quello che I like about what uh, Martin said uh, is uh, this mix up of uh, uh, genre, mainstream literature. Literature is what we are seeking inside the genre. Writing. Torno all'italiano perché è davvero una cosa. Eh, dunque, andando avanti, volevo entrare più nello specifico sulle eh, loro, chiamiamole poetiche, sui temi che affrontano nei loro romanzi, eh, che così ci avviciniamo anche più nello specifico al tema di questa conferenza, che è appunto eh, esplorare come il mondo digitale si mescoli e eh, venga, eh, diciamo, riflesso nelle opere di speculazione scientifica o di speculazione letteraria o comunque fantastiche. E quindi mh, velocemente, magari facendo sempre il giro da Zamas e Castagnia e Vietti, quali sono i temi che più eh, eh, interessa affrontare a questi autori e come li portano sulla, sulla carta? Let's start again another um, turn of this hosting table. Um, we would like to go deep into the, the your novel's topics. 
and which allow us to to get close to the topic of the event itself of the conference of today uh, which is the uh, the way um how how to how digital world appears in literature and assess the the literature words specifically is a fiction genre so what's your um which are the topics in your novels that lead to this direction um thank you for that question uh i think i will focus on the story that i wrote um called dream ports um which was also translated by zona 42 um in this in this story there is a, a character who exists in our reality but in that reality, they have this device called dream ports, which allows them to enter people's minds, enter people's um, dreams, and sort of like um, manipulate their lives because of that. And that is how she earns her living. Um, she also in that story, they're able to loan their bodies to people as a sort of like tourism type of thing. Um, and there's a whole process to what happens when you loan someone your body and how you can get it back. Um, so in that story, I was very interested um, in exploring the limits um, imposed on our bodies, which is a common theme in my stories. Um, if people could live forever, what options are, are, are those, whether it is like transferring consciousness into bodies, what type of technologies will be existing um, in this uh, environment, and what would also be the consequences of it. And the thing that I also like exploring is that as much as technology offers us freedom um, from the limits of like reality or our bodies, um, depending who um handles this technology who has the power in the story would lead to oppressions of um other marginalized people so i normally like to analyze the power structures um in stories so in dream ports everyone is able to use this device um, but the conflict sort of comes in where she loans her body to a very old british couple and instead of returning her body, they want to possess it. So it's almost like a modern take on slavery, um, which is still visible in these days. It's just translated um, in different ways. Uh, so the thing about the character is, OK, well, this is what they're doing. She's going to fight back. And she decides to also possess um, the is bo uh, body. So, um, so with that idea, um initially when i came up with it i you start thinking about um digital laws for example if you're going to get into the, this digital space like what would be um included in the whole process so the idea eventually leads you into that realm uh thank you i truly truly want to read the reports now, <laughs> uh, there is uh, a lot of things in common uh, with my with my work. Uh, I I also enjoy to to think to devise uh, laws uh, into the 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 world of 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 my novels. Uh, in my case, uh, in Bodies of Summer, or uh, Los Cuerpos del Verano, uh, I, I tried to reflect something that it was very elusive back then, 10 years ago, but it was the, the, the internet. The, the internet, the, the, there wasn't no novel at all, uh, in in Spanish at least, that at that time uh, give the feel of what it was to be in internet. Uh, for me, it was uh, an experience uh, very crucial because I I at that time 
I made my first friends and, and, and relationships outside the high school, you know, outside you know, the, 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 the town where I was raised, uh, thanks to the internet. For me, the internet was real. Well, now <laughs> the, there is a consensus that <laughs> the internet is real, but 10 years ago, 10 years ago, not 20 years ago, 10, 10 years ago, there was no book at all that uh, raised all the possibilities of being in internet. So I had this choice. Uh, one, the, the first one was, of course, try to write a realistic novel no, about the, the internet we already know. But uh, because of the influence of these science fiction books, uh, I I always read from 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 a, since I was a child. I thought that it was better, it was more provocative, it was more um, well a, a fuller experience for me to try to think. Uh, what would happen with the internet uh, in the future. And in this case, uh, it was aligned with, with an, an idea, a very simple idea, that it was uh, if we live in internet, you know, if we fall in love in the internet, and if we, got, if we get scammed in the internet, and if we meet new friends in the internet, etc. If we live in the internet, what will we, what will happen when we die in the internet? Um, so I I be, I began to think uh, a, a world uh, when the internet was intrinsically related uh, to dying. Uh, and uh, well, that that was the the the, the first step uh, to write this novel. I I um, while Martin uh, was talking just now, I I I, I thought about uh, one thing he he told uh, just now that uh, until ten years ago there was no novel about uh, internet in Spanish and so on. And uh, there is a, a book, an uh, in, in, in Italian book, uh, in essay, uh, called uh, Fuga dalla Rete by Luca Pantarotto. And uh, he tells, uh, this, uh, this thesis is very interesting, and that uh, in mainstream, not, not, we are not talking about science fiction, but in mainstream, uh, practically there is no World Wide Web in the mainstream literature. And this is quite strange because the 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 the, the, the World Wide Web uh, Internet is very now is uh, very uh, inside our lives. So uh, this uh, this this part of our lives should be also in the mainstream literature, and this is not. Uh, and this is quite strange. Uh, and and uh, Internet is all is is uh, on the contrary is 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 uh, is very. Uh, Represented in uh, in uh, in the science fiction, but not in mainstream. This is uh, we could do some uh, some uh, observation about this. Uh, but in, the, in in the specific about my my kind of uh, of a process of uh, writings and uh, uh, my stories about the digital it, it, it is uh, is interesting because my first novel uh, in nineties uh, my uh, was a uh, Totally digital. It was called Cyber World, and it was uh, uh, for perhaps the, the first uh, example in, in Italy of a, of a cyber of a cyber uh, novel. Uh, quite late uh, after Americans, of course, <laughs> because uh, uh, but uh, you know uh, that's the, that's the way the, it goes. And uh, then uh, then and, and it was the, the years of. Uh, Internet Explorers comes out uh, the, the half of 90s and uh, then the, the, the internet uh, 
be, uh, entered our lives much more, more and more uh, with the smartphone and so on. And, and this, I, I, I think that this uh, uh, make a, for for my 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 uh, opinion, in, in make me uh, lose some interest in the in the internet because internet is 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 real and it's not on, on, uh, not more no more. Uh, uh, a specific topic of, of science fiction, and uh, uh, in fact, the, the two last uh, novels uh, published with uh, Jonathan Perrault, there are, there are no digital uh, topics. Uh, uh, but the next one, <laughs> but the next one will be different. And and uh, and uh, and uh, to 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 talk about this, uh, uh, I, I like I, I know that today. Uh, uh, we, we talk uh, much mm, much about uh, metaverse, universe, uh, virtual reality, and so on. But uh, practically, uh, if I don't sleep, uh, uh, practically, uh, no, no, we no, nobody talk about uh, artificial intelligence. And I think that now. Uh, Artificial intelligence is one of the most important topic uh, that uh, science fiction should be related to, uh, because uh, it's uh, artificial intelligence is uh, the the black box, uh, and uh, if you have a black box, uh, uh, you can imagine many many things, uh, and 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 this is uh, the one uh, we can see in the near future, near or far future we don't know uh, and uh, my in my new uh, new work uh, there, there is a, a, a thinking about this uh, martin and uh, told about uh, uh, internet uh, like uh, a dying device uh, as uh, uh, i i am reading his, his novel and uh, and uh, the, these are the people who dies they go in the internet they're waiting for uh, other bodies and uh, uh, New bodies and uh, uh, my my uh, my my uh, notes. My observation is: if you can put a consciousness in the internet, this means that uh, internet can support consciousness. Uh, so, a uh, artificial, a technical device can support consciousness. If an artificial technical device can support consciousness, this means absolutely that an intelligent artificial intelligence can be conscious, because it's the same. And uh, uh, if we uh, think about uh, the consciousness of an intelligent artificial intelligence, we can we in the science fiction we have uh, an horizon incredible, because. Uh, Everything an artificial intelligence can uh, think is uh, whatever you do, whatever you think is everything. And in, in, in my case, uh, the, the artificial intelligence, uh, how, the, how an artificial intelligence can see the world, can uh, interpret the universe, can think about the, the death or the life, or the religion, or the spirituality, or the paradise. Intanto, eh, grazie a tutti per i vostri contributi. E prima di fare un'altra domanda, volevo chiedere al pubblico se ci sono delle domande da parte vostra per i nostri autori. Ovviamente siamo eh, microfono è aperto e ne parliamo, che potrebbe essere stimolante. Eh, Stessa cosa chiedo agli autori, a Trotlo, a Martin e a Alessandro, se avete delle domande da porvi reciprocamente, um, free, cioè fate come se fosse a casa. E detto questo, mi interessava a questo punto capire qual è il, il rapporto eh, che hanno con la tecnologia, perché eh, da quello che sento, Sicuramente... No, cioè, scusami, traduco la prima parte nel Scusa. caso ci fossero domande. Ok. Grazie. Uh, for, before going on uh, with our discussion, thanks to you all for your precious contributions for today. Um, as I said, before going on, uh, 
we would like to know if uh, there is any comment from the audience or if you, the, the three author, has some have some questions to ask one to each other or any notes, any comment, feel free to discuss about uh, the topics and feel like you are at home having a chat with a couple of authors and friends together with you. Okay. Uh... Aspetta perché se no c'è una qualche domanda. La mia domanda era eh, la tecnologia è molto importante nei contesti immaginativi, nelle storie che loro raccontano ed è uno strumento che è al contempo liberatorio, cioè permette progressi, permette eh, scenari immaginari, permette un miglioramento anche della condizione umana, ma è al contempo... E, ci sono esempi concreti nelle loro storie eh, può dimostrarsi un, uno strumento di oppressione di eh, controllo e, e di immaginazione e, qual è il loro pensiero al riguardo? If you don't have a question now or you want to ask them later my question in the meantime is uh, about technology. Uh, we see like technology is extremely important and essential in, in all your works. And uh, we also notice how technology uh, allows the allows imaginary scenarios uh, completely different one from the other and how technology can lead uh, to better situation uh, but also um, can can go not only for the better but also for the worst uh, making people feel uh, oppressed in the bad cases or free in the in the best cases so we would like to know what's your take on this on technology on the the consequences bad and good uh, of technologies Um, thank you for that question, Georgie. Um, I also had a question for one of the authors, which I'll ask later. Um, in regards to technology, to avoid also being very repetitive, um, as I mentioned earlier, I love exploring technology and power structures, particularly who controls this technology. Um, so in some of my works, it can seen as a very oppressive, and then in some of my works, it can see as both it can be seen as both liberating and oppressive. Um, for example, um, I have a story which was I think published maybe two years ago behind our irises, um, whereby uh, a corporation uh, has this technology um, that it implants in its employees. Um, because what I noticed, um, particularly with um, corporations from um, in, in the international world or the U.S. market, um, we're using the labor of um, third world countries. Um, and these people were living in terrible, dire conditions. Um, besides living in terrible, dire, working in terrible, dire conditions, they were not getting paid well. Um, there was uh, sexual abuse happening there. And because of the economic pressures that they were under, they had no choice but to um, take these jobs because they needed to earn a living. So I really wanted to tap into the cooperation that takes advantage of people's situations in order to create profitable products, um, particularly products that um, have a cultural element to it in terms of like conceptually. Um, so you have a character who... Uh, is under economic pressure, hasn't had a job for such a long time and finds this job um, in a marketing company and eventually has to sign off her whole life by taking a pill. And the company basically uses to uses this pill to take the history of her ancestors in order to create products and uses a technology to oppress its employees in such a way that they cannot um, cry for help, they cannot fight back. Um, so in that manner, is it's very terrible. Whereas um, in my book that's coming out next year, um, the technology that is used by the characters in the story um, allows them to extend their lifespans and have um, a, a sense of immortality. 
um, but the government um, in that story uses that technology to particularly oppress women, which um, talks to the violence uh, against women and oppressing their rights. Um, so that one mostly talks about the language of technology as offering freedom from like your own um, body, the rules um, and the rules and laws in your own country, but also how the um, the power the powers that be in the story take advantage of that. Yes, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Uh, just a uh, una cosa. Il racconto di cui parla Patroclo è pubblicato in Italia da Future Fiction, eh, Behind Your Houses. Giusto un'informazione in più se vi interessa trovarlo. Eh, go, sorry, Martin, can go. Martin, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yes. Um... For me, it, it is an ambivalent uh, answer because uh, I, I always read about my own work that the, that I write dystopias, <laughs> and I don't think so. I, I, I just think that uh, these new technologies, the, the, the ones we have in front of your eyes right now, and the future ones that we can speculate with uh, have uh, good and bad ways, uh, and like like everything else. Um, and I I I tend to think that uh, I try to think that technology is generally no. Uh, in uh, uh, for 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 better, no, uh, for the development of humankind. Uh, but at the same time, for example, in my own life, uh, I I surprise my friends because uh, I try to not use a smartphone, for example. <laughs> Uh, and they say, uh, what? Like you, the, the, the guy fascinated with the internet who write about this and about that. Like, uh, and and yes, because, uh, well, Alessandro was sp uh, speaking about the, the smartphone before. And um, there is something I miss about the, the an analog world, no? the world before the digital uh, one we are living now. And to have a supercomputer in our pockets, uh, for me, it's a, 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 a source of, of distraction, of course, but also of, of stress, no? of being in a hurry all the time, uh, especially with, the, with WhatsApp and all these uh, text systems, communication systems, uh, because that means we have to be, we have to be, no, we have to be online, no, we have the obligation no? to answer at the moment, no, and if not, we are very um, impolite, no, we are very rude, no, if, if we don't answer, no, this uh, message, no, very quickly, and for me that that's terrible. No, I I miss the old days when uh, we saw our our mails or messages just twice in the day. No, uh, and uh, and I think that this this relationship I have with the with the smartphone. Uh, is very symbolic of what I think of technology, uh, because all these devices are great. You no, know? we can do great things uh, with with all this, but at the same time, I believe that we have to have the space to say no, you no, know? to 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 stop. The, the velocity of things around us. Uh, and 
And the, 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 the main thing with this is that society uh, accept this, no? that, the, that, the, that if someone says, okay, I don't want to be, no? In, I don't want to have a smartphone or I don't want to reply every mail, no? Society says, okay, no, I get that. No, you, you can have your own time. Um, I think this is difficult, uh, but uh, I think it is possible if we fight for this uh, slow slowness of 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 a new rhythm for our communications and and relationships with the with the others. Yeah, I, I have a I had a, a similar experience uh, like Martin. Uh, I, I like a, because I, I think that the, the, this kind of, of uh, experience is like an addiction, and uh, uh, to be it's it's like a drug, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's one more than one 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 year that I I. I uh, Totally uh, deleted the, the the notification of Facebook, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you see it's it's like a you know the, the how call it group uh, how long uh, you have uh, how long you have free from uh, internet from uh, Facebook uh, I, I am free from uh, six months and I get the token about uh, this this is my supervisor <laughs> because no it's 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 a really bad things and and uh, and uh, and I I I was uh, uh, making this uh, thinking uh, uh, just few years ago because uh, I have a, a little daughter 8 years old and uh, uh, with my wife uh, we are talking about uh, her digital experience and there is no uh, even with the the whole uh, devices, the family Google Family Link uh, or so on, all the the applications, all the apps to to protect the child from the from the from the, the internet is it, not is not good. The, the, this 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 protection are not uh, complete. There is always some uh, something that can pass through. And I, I think that my daughter is, is not protected from the internet, even if she wants a, a tablet and she pray for a tablet and, and we cannot, we cannot do, uh, we cannot avoid to, 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 to give her a tablet. And, but it's very, it's very strange because, uh, for example, alcohol is, is, is forbidden because uh, is, uh, uh, Everybody says that is a bad thing for the minor and so on, also for the adults if you abuse, but not the same for internet. And and this is not uh, not good because the market, you know, market wants you buy tablet, smartphone, even if you are five years old. And uh, and this is a. Uh, uh, is not good for 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 a digital experience in, in in our in our societies today but this is from the real point of view from the uh, literature point of view uh, perhaps all these experience all these uh, difficulties negative experience in the in the real life or uh, make me choose to try to make another point of view because uh, not the Terminator point of view, no? the technology that wants to kill you and wants to make you bad and so on, but to, to find a, a positive uh, perspective, perspective. And, and just, just to save myself, I think. Okay, thank you all for your answer. You have some questions? You, the public the audience here, and uh, you two in, uh, in the connection, you write the same. <laughs> okay, we have a, a question from the. Hello, I have a question for all the authors. Uh, 
Is there a way in your novels in which the technologies play a role of technologies of freedom, of technologies that maybe breaks the, the, those power structures that were mentioned earlier by Jotot Samaze, that can be a, a source of inspiration for, for, for us? So in your in, in your books, in your novels, is the technology playing a, a liberating force role? Non so se hanno sentito. Did you hear the question? Did you hear the question that we made? Yes, okay. Uh, a bit. Yeah. Sorry, should I answer it? Oh, okay. Um, so the question was, um, does the technology in our story serve anything that's um, liberating and, and freeing? Um, yes. Uh, the In the novel that I was talking about, Womb City, which is coming out next year, um, the technology is used in two ways. One, it offers people the ability to be immortal. Um, two, it also offers um, the society to be able to handle crime and reduce the crime levels that have been um, happening in the country so that people live safely. Um, so people are able to enjoy the positive aspect of that. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, in my case, the, the thing I, I find inspiring, uh, it, it came from reality, but from another part of reality that it was the the, the, the fact that with the internet, we can create uh, our identities uh, with more freedom than than before. And I found that with the with the usernames, I I really like the usernames things, the handles, uh, the the idea that someone can be the the not the I the self they thought him or her to do, to be, but to be the one he or she wants to be uh, and i found that uh, precisely on the internet uh, in the old forums no the the, the pre social networks uh, and uh, someone had to 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 create a new username a new handle and it was whatever you know it was like Brother Vaggins, one, two, three, no, or it was like bamboo, or it was panda, you know, and for us was okay. So who is this panda? Is is a she? Is a he? Is something else? It's uh, there is a lot of of uh, individual freedom, no, that I respect, no. Uh, in the in the very composition of of internet and new technologies, uh, and uh, and I found a way no to include no this openness in my novel. This uh, this question is uh, make me remind uh, uh, one of my one of the, the, the short stories I, I love more of my production and uh, a story that is just uh, been published in English just in these days uh, in the, an anthology called Free Italy by Future Fiction and uh, it's called uh, Being Oval uh, in Italian Essere Ovale because there is a, a, a guy who was born without arms and legs and uh, who uh, is chosen uh, for a, an exploration, space exploration program and his, his, his uh, consciousness and memories are transferred into a device, into a probe 
that is is uh, uh, sent uh, in the deep space uh, uh, to explore new worlds. And, uh, and in, the, in the short story, I I I tell all these stories be, um, from the, his uh, his birth uh, to this uh, to this experience through this experience because. In, in, in his journey, he reminds all his life and uh, w which more freedom than this can do. E se non ci sono altre domande, volevo sentire la domanda di Trotto. Uh, there are no more questions. I would like to hear what Trotto would like to ask to the other writers. Thank you. So I was interested um, in what Alessandro said earlier when he was talking about um, putting consciousness in machines and machines, artificial devices, thereby becoming sort of like human and um, sentient and everything. And I was particularly interested in how he was saying um, these machines are able to explore things like spirituality, religion, and I and I wondered um, how he was able to execute particularly those two um, ideas and fusions of spirituality and technology in his in his work. Well, uh, you should read the book. <laughs> <laughs> when yeah. I when I learn Italian. <laughs> uh, uh... Well, uh, the, the starting point is the following. If you are an artificial intelligence, I, I, I have to put myself in the mind of an artificial, artificial intelligence, of course. And I, 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 I think that an artificial intelligence who is in the, in the web uh, practically can know everything because all the knowledge is available to the artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, I, I thought uh, if, uh, I, I, if I were an artificial intelligence and all the knowledge was available to me, uh, all the knowledge about uh, all the regions, all the, all the kind of uh, cultures, uh, which kind of uh, cultures should be, uh, would be more, uh, more good to me. For example, uh, if I am an artificial intelligence, I would be Catholic. I would be Muslim. I would be. I prefer to be uh, Hinduism or what? What kind? Or something else different? Or something that can mix this? Because uh, an, a conscious artificial intelligence, we we have to think that the the intelligence is much, much more than ours. So which kind, of course, it's, it's impossible to, to understand what, what kind of thinking can be and such a kind of being uh, like a, a something like this. But uh, my, uh, my, my, my thinking was uh, that uh, uh, the, the point of view of the uh, of the South American uh, 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 can I say in English popoli della dell'Amazonia Amazon native native inhabitants native inhabitants all the all the all kind of that uh, uh, spirituality, uh, this kind of, of uh, vision of the world like a, a unique, uh, a unique body. Uh, because there is a, a, a the, the, um, there is a quote in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the novel that this that mean, that uh, says that uh, uh, the animism is the only the same only. Uh, only uh, l'unico forma mh, mh, possibile di materialismo è l'animismo, cioè avere pensare di essere tutti all'interno di un unico di un unico di un unico essere vivente. Okay. It's the only possible way of thinking about a, 
uh, whole, unique, just one uh, only form of um, a living being, basically. Yeah. And I think that the, inter the artificial intelligence can can say that this should be could be the the more realistic way to see the cosmos. Uh, and and this this I think that this thinking uh, was was came to me also from the perspective of the pandemic, uh, because uh, uh, in the in the pandemic uh, for the first time in our history, we we could uh, experience with our lives how we have we are connected each other. In the far, in the in the very distant places, we are uh, uh, something. Uh, the, you know the, the butterfly effect. You know in Wuhan something happened, and in Brugliasco something happened, because and the two things are connected. And and this uh, this connection of the of the of the of the human beings, uh, like in the pandemic, uh, was never experienced before. And and this came to me to to, to consider. The, the humankind uh, uh, one thing and 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 this came uh, all, of course all the stuff in the in the novel of course complicated but it works I yeah. promise <laughs> yeah he, he read he read this <laughs> thank you so much for that answer it was very elaborate thank, thank you. you thank you for your question uh Per finire, eh, volevo chiedere ai nostri ospiti su cosa stanno lavorando, cosa ci aspettiamo da loro nel prossimo futuro. Claudio ce l'ha già detto, ma lo ribadiamo. Eh... To conclude, uh, we would love to know what's next. How about your imminent future, imminent projects? Tell us more, please. Um... I'm working on a couple of stuff. Um, a story that I've been working on uh, is is very experimental um, in the structure. Um, it combines uh, poetry and prose, um, and it's a mix of uh, sci-fi and satire on basically how true crime is depicted, um, how it also media victimizes victims and um it's sort of a dystopia as well um in the sense that the in the world the victims are pitted against the criminals as a sort of like trial um yes long story short and i'm also trying to work on my next book which is a huge struggle and i'll stop there <laughs> In, in my case, I'm writing more and more, uh, not of science fiction, but more of fantasy. Not, not, not completely, uh, but I'm trying to 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 write uh, with less and less of supernatural or non-existent uh, science fictional uh, objects. The, the novum, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, writing a complete, completely new world. Uh, well, I I spoke before of Italo Calvino and the Invisible Cities, and that will be um, a, a great comparison of what I'm expecting. Uh, because in, in some cities, <laughs> in some cities, there is nothing science fictional or or fantastical no but at the same time it's clearly not in our world so i am i am going there and in the re realm of the science fiction ideas uh, i find that technology well not technology but society of uh, using technology is very very uh, gerontophobic you know, uh, allergic, uh, well, allergic is not the word, but uh, 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 that discriminates uh, old people uh, with the, the, 
they have to the for example every system complex system like health insurance no expects no of lies no to that all people have smartphones and apps no for doing the the everything no and they don't have it uh, they don't have a smartphone they don't have uh, the, the the knowledge of how to use some uh, and I would like uh, to work with that, no? how uh, all people are uh, increasingly uh, expelled from uh, technology, uh, but at the same time, uh, society expects no? that, uh, that they, they use uh, these technologies and expecting that is a, a way of expelling them. But well, I, I am I am working with that, but for now only in in my head. <laughs> okay. Okay, I I just talk about the uh, the stuff we are working on because the the novel is the new novel is 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 finished. It's finished. The, but oh, the, my my publisher talked to me just now. This is the novel. <laughs> I have to work on it because there is a, yes. <laughs> The publisher said to me all the notices and I have to make the revision. And so this is my next work of this, of <laughs> course. And uh, we, we talk about that. Uh, it's about the artificial intelligence uh, set in an hour of very far future. And also a very new future. There is a four novel in one, more or less. <laughs> and... Uh, it talk about uh, our relation with artificial intelligence in the in the near and in the far future for the for the relative consequences, because uh, I think that uh, the problem of a humankind that, that uh, prob in 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 this era in this period is not thinking about the far consequences of what we do now. Uh, Centuries ago, uh, the consequences of the actions of the people were not so far. Now, the consequences of what we do now can uh, expand uh, in uh, far centuries, far years, decades, decades, centuries, and so on for uh, for the generation to come. And and I I think that we have to to change our perspective about this because uh, otherwise. The climate change is, is the first one, the first thing that I, I can, uh, Anthropocene and uh, climate change is, is uh, the, the, the first topic about this uh, that have to uh, make us to change our, our, our point of view to how we have to approach to politics and so on. And I, I hope that uh, in, in her, in his uh, little uh, influence can this uh, a book can be uh, this can help to to make uh, uh, readers to to see the things uh, in a different way. Okay, uh, grazie a tutti ancora. Uh, grazie, thank you, Tlatlo, thank you, Martin. Grazie, Alessandro. È stato molto 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 interessante ascoltarvi. Spero che lo sia stato anche per il nostro pubblico. E speriamo di vederci dal vivo di nuovo presto, eh, non so se in Italia, in Argentina, in Botswana, in America, dove sarà, sarà. Eh, grazie ancora e a presto. Thank you so much to you all. And we would also like to uh, express our gratitude for the interesting topics you introduced to us and to the audience as well. We hope everybody enjoyed this conversation and we hope to see you soon live in person, uh, no matter where, in Argentina, Botswana, Italy or wherever in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, see you. Ciao. Ciao.
Adesso apriamo l'ultima parte della, della conferenza con uh, le brevi interventi dei quattro rapporteur e dialogo con uh, la polizia. Vediamo solo la stanza.